Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E. G. Marshall. Settle down and let me ask you a profound and difficult question. What is faith? I'm frank to tell you I don't know. The word faith is in the dictionary, but do we know that the man who compiled the dictionary knew any more about faith than we do? Well, I should like to give you my favorite description of faith, which comes from the Bible from the book of Hebrews, where it is written, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that is what our story is all about. Mr. Mather, I did what you said. I did just as you said. I followed to the letter what you said to do. I've forgotten what I said. You said, wait till the sun is straight overhead then go to the big rock, the, the one that's worn off at the top. You said to take off all your clothes and lie on your belly and press your face hard into the rock and lick the rock with your tongue, you said. Lick the rock 29 times with your tongue. Then, then put your clothes back on and go home and you'll be all right. Did I really say all that? Did I really? I must be losing my mind. Our mystery drama, Faith and the Faker, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Driving a car you knew you were going to buy the minute you saw it. Skyhawk. Buick Skyhawk. You just knew a car this streamlined would be easy on gas, and you were right. In published EPA mileage test results, Skyhawk got 25 miles per gallon on the open road and 16 in the city. Skyhawk. It's rakish, it's low slung, it looks European, but it's a Buick. Living free. Last year, this kid came close to being just a name on a tombstone. Help! What saved him was Ellen Costigan. She knew what to do. I can't because we taught her. Life-saving. 
That's the whole business of the American Red Cross. Sometimes we do big life-saving jobs like sheltering half a million people. Sometimes they're little, like helping an old lady get to the supermarket. Life, it's worth saving. What a shot! Give us a hand. All right. Did you know that more children die from being hit by automobiles and from any other cause? 10,000 pedestrians and cyclists are killed, and another 500,000 are injured in our country every year. And most of these casualties happen to children, especially after dark. There is something to keep your children safer after dark. A safety kit of hot dots, reflective stick-ons that give off a blast of light. Drivers can see them from 600 feet away. Protect your children at night and on dark school mornings. Stick hot dots on bicycles, clothing, books, lunch boxes. Get your hot dots kit free at Northwest Federal Savings, one block west of Cicero Avenue on Irving Park Road or in Des Plaines on Dempster Street, just east of the Tri-State Tollway. But hurry, our supply is limited. A message from Northwest Federal Savings to help keep your children safer after dark. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. Such is the theme of our story, and the leading player is a man who never had faith in anything but himself, and not in the better part of himself either, as we shall soon discover. I'll get the door open in a second, Mr. Mather. Oh, you must be drenched. It's all right, it's all right. Go, go on in, Mr. Mather. Uh, after you. Oh, Eliza! Uh, I, I can't stand the pain. Oh, there, there, my dear one. Somebody help. The pain is... I'm dying. Look here, Judd. I, I brought Mr. Mather. What did you say? Oh, the pain. Mr. Mather is here. Uh, You'll be all right, Judd. You said Mather? Indeed I did. He came out in this terrible storm just to make you well again. He wouldn't come before. Well, never mind about that. He's here now. Uh, Mr. Mather, Uh, uh, show Judd you're here. Uh, Come closer. Hello, Judd. You're here. I'm here. Uh, For all the good I can do you. Oh, you can do it, Mr. Mather. Do what, for heaven's sake? Make the pain go away. How am I supposed to do that? Make my leg the way it used to be. Look look how it is now. Just just look at it. It's all swollen. Uh, Twice its regular size. It's turning yellow. Fix it, Mr. Mather. Judd, I can't. I don't know how. You need a doctor. There's no doctor on the island. You know that, Mr. Mather. Then go to the mainland. There's a doctor there. With his leg the way it is, where he'd never reach the mainland. I don't want no doctor. Not any doctor. I don't have faith in them. I have faith in you. In you, Mr. Mather. Oh, how did this happen? I mean, to your leg. Well, he, he was chopping wood. His foot slipped and... The axe caught him right at the ankle. Uh, it didn't seem like such a deep cut. He's had worse. So we, well, we bound it up, and he went about his business for a couple of days. And, and then the swelling started. And then the fever set in. Oh, feel his forehead. He's burning up. Where's the axe? The, the axe? The axe, the thing that caused the whole mess. Where is it? Well, why, right there by the door. Oh, what are you going to do, Mr. Mather? You, you won't cut my leg off, will you? Oh, of course I'm not going to cut off your leg. I'm going to punish this axe. I'm going to make it suffer. I'm going to torture it. I'm going to make it endure such pain. But but how? How are you going to do that, Mr. Mather? I'm going to crucify it. Crucify? Give me some strong nails and a hammer, Eliza. Oh, yes, Mr. Mather. Y- you're going to crucify the axe? Right here, on this door. Don't you think it deserves to be crucified after what it did to you? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Oh, here are the nails and, and the hammer. <laughs> now, you'll hang on this door, you villain. You'll hang there till you waste away and rot. You understand? Oh, and Judd. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Mather? Be sure you hold on. Hold on to your life. Hold on to your faith. I will. 
I'll try. I will. The thing that tried to kill you is being punished. Now I'm going to tell you what else you must do. Tell me. I'll do it. I promise you. I'll do it. I want you to lie very still in your bed and keep your eyes fixed on the axe. Never let your gaze wander from the axe on the door. Think to yourself how the axe is suffering. Curse it if you like. God will forgive you, for believe me, the devil is in that axe. Have faith, Judd. Keep your faith constant. And keep your eyes on the axe. God bless you, Mr. Matter. Now I must get back to my wife. Oh, how is your dear wife? The same, the same. Good night to you both. Oh, good night. God bless you, Mr. Mather. Now, wasn't that terrible of me, never thinking to ask about his poor wife, paralyzed all these years, and him not able to do a thing to help her? Be quiet, woman. I'm watching... The axe. Faker. Miserable, lying Faker. Charlotte. The prince. Imposter. If there is a god in heaven, he'd strike me dead for my endless frauds. One after another. All my life, why do they believe me? Why do they have that idiotic faith in me? I've never told them I could cure them of anything. More than that, I told them I couldn't. They go on believing and having faith. Faith in me. Can't they see? Do they know? If I had any such power to heal, I'd give it all to Mary. To the one person in all this world I truly love. To my saintly, my adored own wife. Mr. Mather! Mr. Mather! My beautiful Mary, who sits all day in her wheelchair by the window and watches. Go, she says. They believe in you. They have faith in you. Go. And I go. And I know I can do nothing. I don't even know what ails them. But I have been some darn fool rigmarole. And sometimes it works. I don't know why. Mr. Mather, wait up for me. Well, who is it? It's Moses, Mr. Mather. What are you doing out in the storm? Why aren't you back in that cave you call home? I've been looking for you. I, I had to tell you, Mr. Mather. It, it worked. What worked? I'm cured. My stomach's firmed up. The sickness is gone. Mr. Mather, I, I did what you said. I did just as you said. I've forgotten what I said. They've got... How, how could you forget? You cured me of the sickness that was taking away all my strength, that was making a skeleton of me. How, how could you forget what you said for me to do? Well, come on. Come on. What did I say? Uh, you said, Moses, wait till the sun is straight overhead. Then go to the big rock, the one that's worn flat on the top. And you said, take off all your clothes and lie down on the rock, but don't look into the sun or it'll blind you. No, you said, lie on your stomach and press your face hard into the rock and lick that rock with your tongue. You said, lick the rock 29 times with your tongue. I do this every day for eight days, and you'll be all right. Did I really say all that? I must be losing my mind. Oh, you've got a mind different from other minds. We all know that. You all know nothing. Nothing. Well, that's probably true. We island people are very ignorant, but Mr. Mather... We have faith, you see, and that makes up for our ignorance. Look, I'm glad you're better. Now, I've really got to be going home. I don't like leaving my wife alone, especially with a storm like this. The house might be struck by lightning. Oh, how is your wife? Just the same. You can't do nothing for her? Nothing. Hmm. Uh, your 
worth not an island girl, is she? I understand you met her on the mainland. That's right. Now, you see, she ain't got the faith in you that we island people have. Uh, that's the whole trouble, Mr. Mather. She just needs to have the faith. I just made some tea. I thought you'd need it. I do, I do. It's on the kitchen table. Come join me. I shall, of course I shall. I want to hear what happened to poor Judd. I think I'll have a spot of rum in my tea. You? No, not for me. Now tell me. Oh, Mary. Why do you make me go on these fool errands? I don't think they're foolish. Oh, there's Judd lying in bed with his legs swollen the size of a tree trunk and the color of a lemon. I asked him how he'd done it, and he said he'd cut his ankle with an axe. It wasn't much of a cut, so they just bound it up with something. And a few days later, it started to swell. Well, there he is. Can't move out of bed in terrible pain with a raging fever. So what did you do for him? What could I do? I don't know anything about such things. If I tried to do anything, I could kill him. Oh, but you did something, didn't you? No, oh, yes, I did something. I crucified the axe. <gasps> crucified the axe? Well, they were both looking at me, and I felt so helpless. I did the first thing that came into my mind. I asked Eliza for hammer and nails, and I nailed the axe to the door. Oh. Then I told Judd to lie perfectly still, never take his eyes off the axe, to think how the axe was suffering for the sin it had committed. Mary, I don't know why I did that or why I said that. I thought, well, I guess I thought it would take the poor man's mind off his pain. It will help. I'm sure it will. You help so many people. Why can't I help you? I don't care for any of them. I care only for you. If only you knew how I love you. I know, dearest. More every day, I swear it. Each day I think to myself, no man has ever loved a woman as I love my Mary. Then the sun goes down and rises again. And as the day dawns, I think, I think I love her more today than I did yesterday. And yesterday I loved her so much I thought I would burst with loving her. And here it is another day and I love her even more. How can such things be? I don't know. I'm just content that they are. Mary, I must tell you something. What, my darling? It was not... It was not always that way with me. What way? I didn't always love you. No? When we met, I told you almost right away that I loved you. But that wasn't true. No. When I asked you to marry me and, and I said I loved you beyond anything on earth, that wasn't true. No? The whole first year we were married, I didn't love you. But then, then we decided to come here to live on this island. It would be cheaper to live here, we said. But I think it was something else that made us come here. I think, I think it was something in me that made me want to leave the mainland and all that sort of life that I'd lived there. And to be on this, on this tiny spot, surrounded with water, set to the music of seagulls. I wanted to live here alone with you. It was then that I began to love you, not before. I know. Have you always known? Yes. I might have guessed. That's the sort of woman you are. Oh, Mary. There's a doctor on the mainland. If I could get him to come here. Now, darling, you know I... Or if somehow I could get you to the mainland where... He could take a look at you. Dearest, before we came here, we saw a dozen doctors. And they all said the same thing. Do you love me less because I can't walk? You know, I don't. Well, But then. this doctor on the mainland, he would know of, of specialists, of medical centers. Things, things have been developed in the last ten years. That would all be very expensive, my darling. I could get the money somehow. How? I don't know. Somehow, borrow it. Borrow it from whom? Everyone here is as poor as we are. Oh, if we only had the stock in the silver mine that was promised us. I know. If only the old man hadn't died. What's the use of thinking about that? No, no use at all. None at all. So, let's think of other things. Happy things. Oh, now, who could that be? I'm not going out again in this storm. Mr. Mather. Come in, Eliza. Get out of that storm. Mrs. Mather, Mr. Mather, I, I had to come tell you right away. Judd's all right. 
He's all right. The leg opened up suddenly, just like that. He, he was lying on the bed, very still, like you told him to do, staring at the axe you nailed to the door. And suddenly I, I looked at his poor swollen leg and the flesh parted just below the knee and all this yellow poison began pouring out. And Mr. Mather, you know what else? At that very moment that the flesh of his leg parted, that axe dropped straight down to the floor. Straight down to the floor, Mr. Mather. I was standing right there, and I saw everything with my own two eyes. <laughs> What do you wish to ascribe this amazing happening? Was it coincidence? Plain luck? Was it some wisp of magic floating in the air? Was it the substance of things hoped for? The essence of things not seen? That is to say, was it faith? We'll come back to you shortly with Act Two. <laughs> is really killing me just sitting here by the radio with Vina Rosie Wong. Vina Rosie Wong? Say this Vina Rosie is delicious. It goes with so many dishes. Or all alone by the radio. Vina Rosie Wine. Vina Rosie Wine. Come let me pour you some more Vina at the prices of value. Now let's go back to our mystery show. But I have one question before I go. What's light and refreshing imported to? Vina Rose Wine. That's the answer. Vina Rose Wine. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What a wine. Imported by Hugh Blind, Hartford, Connecticut. This is WBBM Chicago. After doing business for 68 years at the same location, Klaus Department Store, located at 2865 North Milwaukee Avenue, must liquidate its entire inventory. Up to 70% off all prices, including famous brands. Over one city block of merchandise must be sacrificed. New price cuts every day, such as 80% off ladies' knit coats, regularly $35, now $5.99. 75% off man's corduroy pants. Regularly $8, now only $1.99. Remember, this is a giant liquidation. Everything must be sold down to the bare walls. Remember, that's Klaus Department Store, located at 2865 North Milwaukee Avenue. Store hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, 9.30 to 5.30. Thursday and Friday, 9.30 to 9. Sunday, 12 to 5. Monday, 12 to 9. That's Klaus Department Store, 2865 North Milwaukee Avenue, in the heart of Chicago. It's 19 degrees in Midway Airport. Weeks have passed since Mather visited the man with the sorely infected leg. And Mather's life with his beloved Mary has resumed its normal course. A narrow life lived meagerly, yet happily, because of the great love between them. Then one day... Mary! Mary! Yes, dear? I'll be right there. No, I'll come to you. No, now don't you bother. This wheelchair gets me around very well. It's my chariot. <laughs> anyway, that's the way I think of it. Oh, what have you got there? It's a letter. A letter? Mm-hmm. Package from the mainland was in the harbor when I was coming back from the market. Captain shouted to me and held up this. He was as surprised as I was. Now, who on earth would be writing to us? Oh, you don't suppose it could possibly be about the silver mine stocks? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, it's too much. Is it about the silver mine? Oh, no, no, no. You remember a few weeks back I told you about old Moses who lives in a cave near the sea? Mm -hmm. How he was troubled with a bad case of diarrhea and the poor old man was near to exhaustion... He begged me for help. Well, what could I say? I said the first thing that came into my head. I said, go lie on the flat rock at midday. Lie on your belly for an hour. Then, because it didn't sound like much of a recommendation, I said, 
Lick the Rock 29 times. I don't know what made me say that. I suppose I like the sound of it. And did he do it? Faithfully, every day. And it worked. It actually worked. Oh, darling. I don't understand why it worked. It was such a such an idiotic thing to tell him to do. But it did work. You made it work. Wait. A week ago, I was passing by that rock, and I climbed up and took some scrapings of it with my knife, and I mailed them to a laboratory and asked them to analyze it. This letter is their answer. Mary, that rock, that silly flat rock lying out there in the sun, it contains a large percentage of kaolin. Of kaolin, Mary. Do you realize what that means? Well, I don't even know what kaolin is. It's a kind of clay, a very fine clay, almost invisible to the naked eye, and it has the property of absorbing things. Oh, it's famous, Mary. People use it in porcelain and for other things, but most importantly, they use it to correct the condition that was destroying poor Moses. Don't tell him. Don't tell Moses. Why not? Well, he wouldn't understand. And he'd rather think it was you. But I don't want him to think it was me. I'll get that. Nicholas, how are you? It's, uh, it's my wife, Mr. Mather. She's, she's very bad. Come in, Nicholas. What's the matter with Nellie? Uh, it, it's the migraine, Mary. And Nellie's half out of her mind with it. Uh, Mr. Mather, please... please. Do something for her. Nicholas, I know nothing about migraine headaches. What about the pills the doctor from the mainland gave her? Oh, they do no good at all. Darling, you must go. But I can't do anything. You'll think of something. Please. Please, Mr. Mather. All right, let's go. You will think of something. You always have. Nellie, I know how much it hurts. An anvil is being struck inside your head. Yes, it's just worse. I know, I know. She can't bear to move her head, not even to take some water. I'm not going to ask you to move your head, Nellie. I'm not going to ask you to move anything. I'm simply going to take your hands in mine. Here, first the right hand, then the left hand. There, that's all. That's all? Hush. This is between Nellie and me, Nicholas. Now, Nellie, try to look at me if you can. Look deep into my eyes. Yes? Look into my eyes, but don't think of me. Think only of your hands. Feel how cold they are. Oh, cold? Like ice? Now think of the ice melting. Think of sun shining on ice. Shining on your hands. Hot, hot sunlight. Hot. Your hands are getting warmer. Warmer? And warmer. And warmer. Why, your hands are beginning to feel hot, burning. Oh. I can hardly hold them. Don't let go. Because... Oh, don't Why? let go. Why, Mary? Because... Because my head is... It's beginning to clear. Good. Is it true? Is it true, Nellie? Oh, the pain. The pain is leaving me. Hold on to my hands till the pain is gone. Don't worry. I'll sit right here and hold your hands till the pain is quite, quite gone. It was ridiculous. I had no idea what to do. All I could think of was that you had said you'll think of something. And holding her hands was what I thought of. So I did it. And it worked. Yes, yes, it worked. I don't know why. Nellie had faith in you. But I don't care about Nellie or Moses or Judd or any of them. I only care about you. And I can't do anything for you. You love me. You make me happy. Do I make you strong and well and able to walk? Even raise yourself from that wheelchair? No. Then what good am I? What earthly good am I? Mary, I've been thinking of something Moses said to me that night during the storm. He said, he said, the reason I could help so many of the islanders was because they had faith in me. Oh, they do, darling. And he said that perhaps the reason I couldn't help my own wife was because, because you're not an islander and you don't have faith in me. Darling, I love you. With all my heart, I love you. 
But do you have faith in me? I mean, the strong faith. The kind of faith that moves mountains, as the Bible calls it. Do you? I only know I love you. Mary, I'm going to get that doctor from the mainland. One way or another, I'm going to bring him to this island. Without money? I'll mortgage my life. And without a boat? I'll borrow a boat. With no one to sail the boat? I'll manage. You'll see. You'll see. I'll manage somehow. Uh, Mr. Mather, uh, it's, it's Nellie again, another migraine. You must come. She's in such pain. Nicholas, not now. I, I have other things on my Please, mind. Please, Mr. Mather, you, you don't know how she suffers. Two weeks ago, when you cured her, that, that was bad enough, but this time, it, it, it's worse. You must come. Darling, go with Nicholas. You really want me to? I want you to. Very well, if my wife wants me to go with you, Nicholas. Come on. You will think of something, my darling. You'll see. You'll think of something. I know. It hurts, doesn't it, Nellie? I know it hurts. Your head is bursting with pain. Your stomach is churning. Mr. Mather, why do you just stand there? The, the light through the shutters pierces your eyeballs, doesn't it, Nellie? Aren't you going to take her hands, Mr. Mather, or tell her to look into your eyes? No. Why not? Are you going to do something else? No. But you can't let her suffer like that. Aren't you going to do anything at all? No, but you are. Me? What can I do? What I did. But I have no power, Mr. Mather, not like I'm you. I'm going to give you my power. Come here. Pull that chair up to your wife's bedside. Sit down. Now, take your wife's hands in yours. That's right. <laughs> Nellie, look at your husband. Look at him. Nicholas. Dearest. Nellie, your hands are in your husband's hands. Now I'm going to put my hands on top of his hands. Whatever power is in me will pass from my hands into his. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand, Nicholas? Yes. All right, then. Now look deep into your husband's eyes, Nellie. Never let your gaze wander. And you, Nicholas, keep your eyes fixed on the eyes of your wife. That's it. Very good. Neither of you knew the moment when I removed my hands. That means that my power went into the hands of Nicholas. And now the power in the hands of Nicholas is passing into your hands, Nellie. Yes. I feel... What do you feel? Heat. Heat in my hands. My, my hands are burning. They are burning, Mr. Mather. I can feel them. Like flame. Don't let go. Hold on, Nellie. How does your head feel? Oh, better. Oh, much better. Oh, Nellie. Uh, the pain is nearly gone. Stay like that, the two of you, for another ten minutes, and the pain will be gone completely. Oh, Mr. Mather. Oh, how can we ever thank you? I must be getting back to my wife now. Well, surely that there must be something we can do for you. you. You've done so much for us. Nothing, really. Oh, wait a moment. You have a boat, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. And Nicholas, you know how to sail it? Yes, yes, I know how to sail it. Will you take me to the mainland in your boat? Of course. And bring me back? Well, yes, I certainly will, Mr. Mallet. Fine. Sometime in the next couple of weeks. Oh, one other thing, Nicholas. You and I will be making a trip to the mainland alone. But on the return trip, there will be another man with us, a very important personage. Is that understood? Anything you say, Mr. Mather, we owe you so much. You will repay me in full. I am quite sure that there is at least one person who has faith in you. Is it your wife? Your husband? Your father or mother? A child? At the very least a dog or a cat who trusts you to fulfill the unspoken promises made by the very existence of your love for each other. Of course there is. No if, and I hate to utter the words, if there is not, then you must be the unhappiest person in the world. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. 
Why weren't that sinus medicine? Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign off tablets. S I N E O F F. The sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And sign off doesn't stop there. Have you tried sign off sinus spray? The fastest known form of sinus congestion relief. It works in seconds. That sign off sinus spray. When sinus flares up, use sign off tablets and spray only as directed. S I N E O F F. Sign off. Exactly. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Tell me something. What do you think of when I say Culligan? Culligan? Uh huh. I think of water. Yep. Everyone gets that right away. I guess it's because Culligan's only business is good water. Just water? Just water. In 85 countries all over the world, Culligan's full-time business is the softening, filtering, and conditioning of water. Full-time? Full-time. And Culligan water softeners come in a bigger selection and a wider range of prices with exclusive features like triple hull tanks and like that. Your Culligan man is a man who cares. Say, does the Culligan... So do as your neighbors do. To rent or buy the leading brand of water conditioner, just call your nearby Culligan man. All right. Hey, Culligan man! There's his truck now. His truck? I thought he'd come in a boat. Want to try Culligan soft water without buying? Now you can rent an automatic water softener for as little as $5.50 a month. For complete details on how you can rent a Culligan, pick up your phone and say... Hey, Culligan man! This is WBBM Chicago. News Radio 78, 19 degrees at Midway. It's 11.06. Two weeks have passed since Mather mysteriously conveyed to Nicholas the means by which he might cure the migraine headaches of his own wife. In return, Mather exacted from Nicholas a promise to take him in his sailboat to the mainland. Now Mather is about to demand the fulfillment of that promise. Come in. Come in. Mr. Mather, come in. Come sit down. Have some coffee with us. Thank you, no, Nelly. Another time. Nicholas, today's the day. What day is that? Today is the day you take me to the mainland in your boat. Oh. You haven't forgotten your promise, have you? Oh, 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 no, no, no. Oh, we would never break a promise to you, Mr. Mather. Uh, how, how long will we be away? I, uh... I don't like to leave Nellie alone too long, you know, if one of her headaches should come back. Should take us the better part of a day to get there. Then perhaps part of a day to find the person I'm looking for. A little time to persuade him to come back here with us. Three days, probably. Four at the most, the very most. Now that you've shown me how to rid Nellie of her terrible headaches, I, I hate to leave her. Oh, Nicholas, you promised. You you must keep your promise. Thank you, Nellie. Oh, I'll be all right. I know I will. And Oh, something else, Mr. Mather... Every day, I'll, I'll go to your house to be sure Mary's all right. Mary does pretty well for herself. She knows how to get around in her wheelchair. Oh, yes, but she might need something from the store. And besides, she'd like the company, wouldn't she, with you away? Of course she would. <laughs> and it's very kind of you to offer. Nicholas, bring the boat to my dock in, we'll say, about an hour. Well, I could be there sooner, if you like. No. No, an hour would be soon enough. I want a chance to talk to my wife, tell her of Nellie's kind offer, and, and a few other things. Goodbye, and thanks to you both. A good journey, Mr. Mather. <laughs> I'll see to that. Mary. I'm right here, dear. I just talked to Nicholas. He's going to sail me to the mainland, and I'm going to see that doctor. I'm going to tell him about you, and I'm going to bring him back here. Oh, darling. My mind's made up. Without money. Before I go, my love, I must tell you... A story about myself. Now, there's nothing about you I don't know. We've been man and wife for ten years. This is a story about me before we ever met, ever married. And I have to tell it to you. Now, it can't wait. Darling. I have to tell you now. If you must. All right. Before I met you, Mary, I may as well say it right out. I was one of the top ten swindlers in the country. Swindlers? Con men, confidence men. Men who... 
Men who trim suckers. I, I don't know what that means exactly. Men who pretend they have ways to make large sums of money for people who trust them. My favorite gimmick... Gimmick? A scheme. A scheme for getting money out of people. My favorite scheme was the dying stockholder pitch. Pitch? The tale I tell the suckers. The story. I tell them I was a financial developer of mining properties. But that's what you told me. I know. Yes, I know. Then I tell them that there was this silver mine out in Nevada or someplace that had been closed down five years ago when the vein ran out. But now the State Bureau of Mines had found a new vein and it was going to open it up again. Well, you told me... Wait, 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 wait. Then I tell them that the last quotation on it was a dollar a share, but if the mine was to be reopened, it would be worth ten. Well, yes, dear, but... But I'd say that the only hitch was that the stock was held by a very, very old man, a very sick old man, a very sick old man who was desperate for money, and if he got it right away, he'd sell the stock at a dollar a share. I know all this. I know you do. Because I told the whole story to you. And you gave me all your money, Mary. All your savings. Every penny you had in the world. But the old man died. He died before he could transfer the silver mine stock. That's what I told you. And he spent the money on doctors and nurses. That's what you said. And he never got around to sending us the stock certificates. So we had no proof that we'd sent him the money to pay for the certificates. That's what you told me. Oh, Mary, my sweetest, my dearest, my most beloved. There never were stock certificates. There never was a silver mine. There never was an old man who was sick and dying. Well, then... Then what happened to the money? I kept it. It's what we've been living on for the last ten years. But why... I don't understand. Why didn't you just... Just take my money... And and go off somewhere. You must know the answer to that. But I don't. Because I couldn't bear to leave you. But why not? Because I'd begun to love you. It was such a strange... Such a new feeling for me. Because I'd never loved anyone in my life. I didn't know how to say the word. Even when I asked you to marry me, the word love wouldn't come to my lips. I remember... But you married me anyway, and... Oh, my darling. For ten years, such love has been growing in my heart. And I've watched it grow. And now, my dearest, I'm going to sail to the mainland with Nicholas. I'm going to find the doctor who will make you well, who will release you from that wheelchair so that you can walk, run on the beach with me. But we're happy the way we are. Dearest, tell me before I go. Tell me you forgive me for the lies I told you ten years ago. For the lie I've lived ever since. For ten years I've known all I needed to know about you. That you loved me. Nicholas will be along pretty soon with his boat. Let's just sit by the window and wait for him. And hold each other's hand. And not talk at all. me. I'm coming in. Oh, come on in, Nellie. Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry I'm so late. That's all right, Nellie. Yes, but I promised I'd be here first thing in the morning. Well, you have been every day. Oh, till today. Oh, I'm so sorry. Now, Nellie, don't make such a fuss. Here, there's coffee on the table. Help yourself. Oh, that I will. And then I'm going to tell you the most fantastic story you ever heard in all your born days. Well, I've heard a lot of fantastic stories in my time. Oh, well, not like this one you haven't. Oh, you, you want coffee? No, oh, no, thanks. I've had plenty. Well, then, wait till you hear what I'm going to tell you. I'm waiting. But as you very well know, your husband and mine have been gone for three days. And your day will be the fourth day. And well, you know, Nicholas was very nervous about going because he didn't want to leave me. And but to tell you the truth, I was nervous about his going, too, for fear I might have another one of my headaches. Ever since your husband showed my husband how to make them go away, well, well, you know all about that. Yes. Yeah, well, everything's been all right. And after all, they were only going to be gone three or four days. What could happen? Such a short time. The trip was so important. 
Your husband said something about bringing somebody back to the island with them, some very important personage. A doctor. A doctor? Really? A doctor who might be able to help me. Yes, it, it's so strange that your husband can help everybody, but, but he can't help you. Oh, he helps me. Just by living with me and loving me. Oh, but not to walk. No. But go on with what you were going to tell me. Oh, well, Mary, this morning I woke up and... What do you think? I don't know, Nellie. Tell me. Another migraine headache. That's what I woke up with. Oh, no, Nellie, no. I was in despair that the pain... But then, you know what I did? I lay quietly in my bed. And I thought of Nicholas... And I thought of your husband, too, I admit it. And I thought of how they held my hands and and looked into my eyes. And how my hands grew warmer and warmer as they held them. And how the pain in my head grew less and less. And Mary, do you know what started to happen? Tell me. My hands grew warmer and warmer till they were hot. I did it myself, Mary, all by myself. I I myself made my own hands grow hotter and hotter till I felt as though they were on fire. And little by little, the pain in my head started to go away. Nellie, how wonderful. So, so that's why I'm late coming to see you. Well, it's all right, Nellie. Truly, it is all right. Oh, well, the, the men should be on their way back by now. Yes, why don't you go to the window and look out? I'll make some fresh coffee. Oh. Good, good. We'll have coffee ready for them. Oh, they'll be coming up alongside the dock. Now, you'd best let Nicholas know you're here, Nellie. I will. Nicholas! Nicholas, I'm here. I'm here with Mary. She's making coffee. Hurry! Oh, they'll be right in. They're tying up the boat. I'll pour the coffee. You want me to do it? No, no, I want to do it. A cup for Nicholas... A cup for my beloved husband. And a special cup for the wonderful doctor. Oh, shall I pour another cup for you? Why not? This is a very special occasion. <laughs> and one for me, too. That must be Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas. Oh, my dear, I have such things to tell you. Where's my husband? He's coming. And the doctor? Darling. Oh, darling, there you are. Look. Look at what we have for all of you. Fresh, hot coffee. Five cups. It's a special occasion, Nellie says. What's the occasion? Why, the... The, the doctor? Yes, the, the... Where is the doctor? There is no doctor. You couldn't find him? Well, we, yes, we, we found him. He... He wouldn't come? No, he wouldn't come. Was he... Was he afraid to make a trip? Yes, he was... He was afraid of the trip. Mary, I tried... I tried my best. Close the door, darling, will you? It's getting very cold in here. Mary, I told him I'd work for him for the rest of my life. Believe me. Stay where you are. Stay right where you are, by the door. Mary, please. Don't move. Don't come near me. Mary, wh what are you doing? Don't any of you come near me. What is she trying to do? I... I think she... I think... Mary, are you sure? Very sure. Very, very sure. Oh! Mary! Mary, what are you doing? I am... I am... Very slowly. Very surely. And very lovingly. Walking into the arms of my husband... Hold out your hands, my darling. I am walking. I'm walking to greet you at the door of our home. Oh, Mary. Oh, my Mary. Oh, my wife. <sighs> the moral of our story, if it has a moral, why, that the handmaiden of faith 
is truth. That without perfect truth, there can never be perfect faith. But when both truth and faith are perfect, why then, miracles happen. As one has just happened in our story called Faith and the Faker. I'll be back shortly. You're on the open road, rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. midsize car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Your Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all, it's a Buick. Living free. Do I have a headache? Why do they have to make these caps so hard to open? For a very good reason. Children open things that they shouldn't. That's why we have safety packaging. For the life of your child, you can live with a little inconvenience. For further information, write the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, Washington, D.C., 20207. cannot resist going back to my first definition of faith, the definition given us by the good book itself. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The lines bear repeating and deserve memorizing, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That, dear listener, is faith. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Mary Jane Higby, Rhina Rayburn, Guy Sorrell, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. When you're afraid your old man will yank Kate out of town, or at least hide her somewhere, it's now or never. How do we do it? Well, if your house wasn't in the country, we couldn't. Sure, the place is locked and barred, but uh, what we do is get a rope ladder up to Katrine's window cell. What about the guard? How do we get through the gate? I'll take care of him. He's a cinch. You'll stay out of sight while I rap with our friend. I'll be a drunk looking for a shot of booze to cure a hangover. Oh, Jody. Listen, it'll be a great act. I'll be falling down drunk, see? I get close to the guy, he's off guard. Whammo, I knock him out. You go up the ladder and persuade Kate to come down it. Can I persuade her? Oh, sure you can. You hold all the cards, sweetheart. That plan you've worked out for her is a winner. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata, this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. 
You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! The Weird Circle In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, pull the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the Weird Circle. Speak again their immortal tale, the Knightsbridge Mystery. Saturday night, I killed Gardner. That's the incredible part. I killed him. It is sitting here next to me now. Sitting in his usual chair by the fireplace here at the old Knight's Bridge Inn, acting as if nothing unusual had happened. How can a man be dead and alive at the same time? I remember the whole thing so clearly. It was just two days ago. Two short days ago. Last Saturday, to be exact. Gardner's a landowner and had just collected his rents. The banks were closed, so he hid the money in his room here. And his room is next to mine. And it was all so easy. It was raining that day. Yes, it was raining hard enough to drown out the screams of a man being murdered. Gardner, Professor Nelson, and myself were sitting around the fire, just as we're sitting now. And I needed money. Needed it desperately. Well, not for myself, I don't count anymore, but for my son. My boy, Jack. He's 21, and a man needs money to keep his son in college. I'd done everything I could think of to raise that money. I'd even worn various disguises. Wigs and makeup, and sat on the steps of the bank in London to beg for farthings. Imagine it. Me, Captain Cowan, being a beggar on the streets. And Gardner was rich, fat, rich, and alone. Nobody would miss him. That is, nobody but his fat, sleek cat. And I, I had my son, my boy, Jack. I remember everything that happened that Saturday night. The three of us, Gardner, Professor Nelson, and myself, were sitting around the fireplace, and it was raining. Nasty night, isn't it, Mr. Gardner? Yes, quite nasty, Professor Nelson. You know, I don't see why you scientists don't do something about the weather. Well, many men have thought about that very thing. Thinking. Oh, they ought to take action. Thought is idle. Action brings results. Oh, think me... If I haven't coined an epigram. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They were talking about the weather, and I was thinking about killing Gardner. He had to die. That was obvious. And soon, too. But how? And who would be the scapegoat to hang for the deed? Somebody would have to be. Somebody. But who? I couldn't have managed to go downtown in this rain, even if the banks had been open today, blast it. Oh, it's confounded uncomfortable keeping large sums of money about you because of a conspiracy between the weather and the Bank of England. Well, surely the money is uh, safe enough here, Mr. Gardner. One would think so, but you never can tell. Nothing makes a man more jumpy than keeping a large sum of money in his top bureau drawer. Of course, there's always the danger of robbery. Robbery, yes. Or murder. Murder, Captain Cowan. Oh, nobody in the Gardner family has died for generations. We Gardners just don't die. 
rather set against that sort of thing. You've uh, made up your mind to it, eh, Gardner? Quite, quite, Professor. Uh, that should have been my first hint. He himself definitely said he couldn't die. Yes, he said it then, but I, I thought he was joking. Nobody ever knew whether he was joking or not. He had a dry, soft way of joking, but I, I didn't realize that then. I just sat there when the door opened and the chambermaid came in to tidy up. I was hoping that everybody would remain quiet so I could think the whole thing out. But she came toward us and... Uh... Anything I can do for you before I retire for the night, Professor Nelson? No, no, nothing, Barbara, nothing. Mr. Gardner? No, thanks. That girl, get your rest. You, Captain Carwin? Yes, as a matter of fact, I've, I've got to get on to London tonight. Tonight, Captain, in this weather? Yes, Mr. Gardner, important business. Uh, so if it's not too much trouble, Barbara, you might tell the hostler, Mr. Cox, to saddle my horse. I ain't going down to the stables to see Mr. Cox, Captain. He ain't a man, Dan Cox, ain't. He's a beast, he oh, is. come, come, Barbara. Poor Dan Cox is no beast. He's an unfortunate victim of an accident which has reduced his mentality to that of a small child. Child, is it, Professor? He's an idiot. He'll murder a human some day, he will. Oh, it's not that bad, Barbara. Why, you're the last person I'd expect to speak decent of him, Captain. He don't like you. He says he remembers you from somewhere. He don't remember, though. <laughs> and I says to him not to talk about a fine gentleman like you, I says. Oh, there ought to be a hospital for the mentally unsound. Not only for idiots like poor Dan Cox, but for men whose minds are warped and twisted. And those people may be completely harmless, but they need medical care. Well, do you think so, Professor? I'm sure of it. I've conducted many interesting psychological experiments on the subject, Captain. I've even known men who think they've committed a crime. Uh, is there anything else, gentlemen? Uh, 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 oh, no, no, thank you, Barbara. Good night, Barbara. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night Barbara. You interest me, Professor. It's a fascinating subject, Cowan. There was a man once who thought he had murdered his wife and two children. He went to the station house, confessed the murder, and then killed himself. And he hadn't committed the crime at all? No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> well, gentlemen, you must excuse me. If I'm going to get to London tonight, I must be off. Uh, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Cowan. I shut the door behind me, very casually, just as if I really were going to London. I walked to the stable through the heavy rain. You see how clever I was? And they thought I was going to London. And they didn't even suspect that Gardner was going to die. The dark rainy night was perfect for the murder. And Daniel Cox appeared to me to be a likely victim for the law. He was an idiot. A poor fool who would be completely helpless in my hands. And the townspeople would obviously believe anything against Dan Cox. I knocked on the stable door. Dan Cox! Dan Cox! Hello. Hello, Dan. I came down to visit you. <laughs> Did you? Did you? Mind if I come in? In here with me. In the horses. <laughs> Cox. You like me, don't you? I like everybody. Everybody. Everybody I like. Me and the horses. I saw you once. Somewhere. Somewhere. But where, Captain? Where? Where? You're imagining things, Cox. I've been looking at you, Captain Cowan. Trying to remember. I'd never seen you before I came to this inn, Cox. Didn't you now? Didn't you? I wonder where... Well, I didn't come here, Cox, to argue. I came down here as a friend to ask a favor. Favor, Captain? You like this one, Cox. Barbara sent me down here to ask you to do her a favor. Barbara did? Barbara? Pretty Barbara? <laughs> yes, she is, Cox. <laughs> and she likes you. She told me that she wouldn't trade all the fine gentlemen the inn for you. For me? Nobody likes me. Why, you misjudge yourself, Dan Cox. She asked me to get her a lock of your hair and a piece of your coat as a going-away gift. Uh, is Barbara going away? Yes, uh, day after tomorrow. She's leaving the inn for good. A lock of my hair and a piece of my coat. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> Women are funny. 
Uh, hard to tell what they're thinking. <laughs> well, will, will you give it to me? Are you lying, are you? Are you? Here, take my pocket knife. Here, you can snip it off yourself. Uh, thank you, Captain. Thank you. Here's the cloth in the air. Nobody ever liked me before. Just my horses. My horses. Thank you, Cox. Why do you look at me like that, Captain? I was thinking what a lucky man you are, Cox. Oh, uh, will you bridle my horse before you turn in for the night? I'll be leaving for London shortly. Uh, sure, I'll bridle Queenie right away. <laughs> walked back to the inn to say goodbye in case anyone was around. I had thought the whole plan out so carefully. Now I had evidence. The, the, the kind of evidence police officers look for. A piece of Cox's coat was to be found on the edge of Gardner's bed and the lock of Cox's hair in the dead man's hand. That circumstantial evidence. The plan was working perfectly. I walked briskly to the door, opened it, Professor Nelson was sitting by the fire, looking into the flames. When I walked in, he started suddenly. Uh, uh, <coughs> haven't you left for London yet, Captain Coward? No, not yet, Professor. Where's Mr. Gardner? Oh, he took his cat with him and went up to bed. He was tired. Uh, <coughs> won't you join me by the fire? Well, some other time, Professor. But tonight I had better start if I'm ever going to get there. Oh, yes, indeed, yes. Oh, midnight. Oh, I must be tired. My reflexes work by the clock, sir. Definitely by the clock. I think I'd better retire myself. Oh, well, Captain. Pleasant journey. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, uh, why don't you sleep here and wait till tomorrow, sir? Traveling's difficult in this weather. <laughs> Sorry. I have important business in London, Professor. I stood uh, in the living room, watching the old scholar slowly climb the stairs. He walked slowly, refusing to be hurried. And then I heard his door open and close. And I knew he was in his room. And then I waited for a short time and started to creep up the stairs to my room. I had to prepare my makeup. The change from the genius Cowan to the idiot Cox. Gardner had to die. In less than a half hour, I had completed the transition. I stood in front of the mirror looking at myself. I'd done a good job. That I knew. The disguise was perfect. I was no longer Cowan. I was Cox, battered, bulbous nose and a raggedy coat and dagger. I crept slowly to my window and opened it, planning every move. And I... Oh, I was clever. So very clever. Then I crept carefully out on the ledge. Gardner's window was open and barely four feet away. I moved slowly over the ledge like a cat in the night, step by step. The panel was slippery from the rain, and the night was dark. Dark. I could hear Gardner's heavy breathing as I crept through his window to his room. He was asleep. And there was no moon in the sky this night to give me away. I walked slowly to his bedside, dagger upraised, and then... Oh, the cat! I'd almost forgotten his fat, sleek cat. Oh, I'd forgotten that mewling, spewling cat. I was clever. I worked faster. Right to Gardner's bedside, and then I plunged the dagger. <laughs> oh, the knife! The knife God, oh. went in deeply, deeply, deeply. And I, I remember his last breath. It was like the the sound of a dying fire or the moaning of the wind, a futile gasping. And then he was dead. Dead. You see? You see, I did kill him. I remember every single detail, and I was so clever. 
so very clever. I remember my cleverness. I killed him. I killed him. And yet he's alive. Gardner's alive. Sitting here next to me. by his bedside and pulled the knife out of his heart. I placed a piece of Cox's coat on the edge of the bedside and a piece of his hair in the dead man's hand. Then ruffled up the bedclothes and I started my search of the room. I opened the drawers, the closets. Every single hiding place possible was combed for the money. I heard footsteps outside the door. Did I hear somebody scream out? Is anything wrong? Funny, I thought I heard... I had to work quickly. Get the money, the money... Then I remember Gardner had said it was in the top bureau drawer in the corner. Yes, in the top bureau drawer. And there, there it was. A knock on the door disturbed me. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, did you call me? I didn't know what to do. Answer and pretend I was Gardner. That seemed logical and clever. I strained my voice and called out. Oh, yes, Barbara. What do you want now, girl? I heard someone scream and... I thought that beast Cox was in your room, Mr. Gardner. No, everything's all right. Good night, girl. Good night, sir. I, I had to get out of there as soon as possible. Back to my room. And out of the window, over the ledge. It had stopped raining. And the moon, the moon was coming out. A bright, full moon. It outlined my shadow on the ledge. And I remembered my own cleverness. If I was seen, they wouldn't see me. They'd see Cox, the half-wit Cox. I climbed in my window, clutching the money. I thought for a moment I'd seen someone on the lawn watching me. Once in my room, I removed my makeup. I prepared to leave. With one clean stroke, the murdering Cox had disappeared. I was cowering again. I opened the door to the hall. Crept down the hall to the stairs. I noticed a candle burning in the parlor. The chambermaid was standing there in a pool of light, talking to Nelson. That was a hitch in my plans. Professor, I tell you, I heard someone scream out. If you're half the man you claim to be, Professor... You'd go down to that stable and find out what Dan Cox is up to. It ain't no good, I'll tell you that. Go back to bed, Barbara. Whatever Cox is up to, it can't be very dangerous. Go to bed, my dear. Good night. Good night, sir. Nelson started up the stairs. I had to hide. But where? The stairway was dark. I pressed myself against the wall into the shadows. Nelson came closer and closer. He was close enough to touch me. I could only pray he wouldn't look my way when he turned on the landing. There's somebody up here. That silly woman is getting me all a flutter. Then he continued on upstairs. The girl stood in the middle of the parlor, and I was trapped. My heart beat wildly. I crept on down the stairs to listen. Who is it? Who is it? Pretty, pretty Barbara. You understand me, you do. You can help me. What are you doing at the inn, Dan Cox? Go on, get back to the stable. You like me, don't you? No. I had to see somebody that likes me. Yes, I had to, cause I... Get away from me. Get away from me, Cox. I ain't gonna hurt you. Not hurt pretty Barbara. Let go of my arm. Let go, Cox. Barbara, pretty Barbara. <sighs> I ain't two people, am I? I ain't two people. You beast, you ape. I saw myself standing on the ledge tonight, and I know myself by my nose in my ass. <laughs> Let me go, It was Cox. me, standing on the ledge, looking down at me, standing on the grass near the end. 
Two people. They both can't be me. I'm not one. I'm two, yes. And it don't make sense. Let me go. Cox, let me take your hands off my throat. pretty, Barbara, pretty. Barbara. Barbara. Dead. I must be dreaming. That's it. Dreaming. I'll go back to the stable and go to sleep. And when I wake up, this won't have happened. I've been dreaming all along. Else, how could I be sitting on the ledge looking down at me, sitting on the grass? I'll go back to the stable and wake up. Edith had fallen into my trap, and I was pleased, so pleased. I moved very carefully, very slowly, creeping to the parlor, and I stopped. I looked at the still body of the girl, at the death-like quality of her face, and knew Cox would hang for a double murder. Yes, a double murder. That was fortunate for me. I opened the door, and the moon shone fully upon me. I hurried across the gravel path to the stable. My only thought was to get to get to London, to get to my boy, to my son, to Jack. I knocked on the door and called. Cox! Dan Cox! Do I look asleep, Captain? You look as if you might have been sleeping, Cox. Come, man, where's my horse? Your horse? What horse? Queenie. Is Queenie saddled? I must be dreaming. I am asleep, ain't I, Captain? Because if I was awake, I couldn't be on the ledge and on the grass at the same time. Do I have to get my horse myself, Cox? I killed a woman, Captain. I killed her. Why am I two people? I killed her and it's your fault, Captain. It's all your fault. I hate you. I hate you. What are you talking about, Cox? You don't know, do you? No, you don't know. You told me she liked me. You said she wouldn't trade me for all the fine gentlemen in the inn. You said in your lies. Because she ain't... Are you insane, Cox? Do you think anyone would believe that story, the story of an idiot? Idiot? I'm not an idiot. I had an accident a long time ago. A funny accident. And sometimes I can't remember. Sometimes I... Stop it, Cox, and get my horse for me. Sometimes I can remember clear. Like sometimes I can remember who you are. And then again I can't. And you made me kill her. And it's all your fault. Fool, I'll teach you a lesson you'll never forget. Get out of my way! Oh. I'll saddle my horse myself. I rode off, leaving Cox sobbing like a baby in the corner. I went to London to my son. I paid his bills, gave him his allowance for the year, and hid the rest of the money on my person. This morning, I returned to the inn and found this. These men sitting here at the old Knight's Bridge Inn, chatting gaily. Barbara was serving them tea as if nothing had happened. Nelson and Gardner asked me to join them by the fire. I sat down here, puzzled and confused. I know I killed him. I saw him die. And they started to talk. They've been talking for a half an hour like this, and I can't stand it anymore, just sitting here waiting. Well, what's the matter with you anyway, Captain Guile? You've been quiet as can be ever since you came back from London. Yes, hasn't it? Amazing, isn't it? I took a trip to London myself Monday morning, but I didn't come back in a sad mood. London cheered me. Yes, I had got rid of that confounded pack of money I was carrying around. It had me blasted and nervous. Yeah, I can well imagine it did, Mr. Gardner. I hear you're in for congratulations, Captain Cowan. Uh, congratulations? Yes, we heard you'd won a packet of money in the Irish sweepstakes, almost 500 pounds. I didn't win money in the sweepstakes. I didn't. Oh, nonsense, Captain. Don't try to keep that from us. What are you trying to do to me? Drive me crazy? Drive me insane? I didn't win money in the sweepstakes. You're supposed to be dead, Gardner. Dead. You understand? I went to a lot of trouble to kill you. Yes, and I killed you with my own hands. And stole the money. And Barbara was dead too. Cox killed her. You've got to believe me. I disguised myself to look like Cox and I killed Gardner. Yes, I killed him. 
You're dead, Gardner. And the dead can't rise from the grave. They can't. They can't. Answer me. Don't stand there looking at me. Answer me. Professor. Professor, tell me the truth. Yes, Captain Cowan, I'll tell you the truth. Barbara was not killed that night. She was merely frightened and fainted. But you murdered Mr. Gardner by your own confession. You'd planned a perfect crime. A crime so perfect that Cox might have hung for Gardner's death if it hadn't been my little experiment. Experiment? What experiment? A psychological experiment, Captain. You see, I looked up your record and found out that you were an old vaudeville actor and specialized in character parts. That's where Cox remembered you from. You were on the stage the day he had his accident. So I played your own trick back on you. The only way we could get you to admit your crime was to bring Gardner back to life. This gentleman is not Mr. Gardner. He's just an actor, cleverer at makeup than you ever were. No, Captain Cowan, I wouldn't try to escape. Your confession has been taken down, and the inn is surrounded by the police. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the Knightsbridge Mystery. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of The Whistler? The 
Whistler. I was with Danny when it happened, but I couldn't hang on to him. He ran off and left me, and I, I've been looking for him ever since. That was Captain Fowler. Something had happened to his friend, Danny. I ain't going to no doctor at this time of the night. Tomorrow, maybe, but I'm not going tonight. That was Danny. Danny knew something had happened to him, but he didn't know what it was. But, Danny, you couldn't have done a thing like that. I know. Don't worry, Danny. That was Faye, Danny's girlfriend. And this is Joe Rodriguez, a fisherman. It's much better that I leave town, Danny. If I stay, I might forget I am your friend. Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the strange story of Fog. Well, Danny, my boy, this is the thickest fog I've seen in this harbor in many a year. Mm Mm-hmm. I've been a sailor man for a long time. Yeah, that's right, Captain. Can't see a single light along the entire waterfront. But we don't need light for where we're going. I know the way to the anchor pool room. Yeah. Yeah, I know too. Hey, uh, Danny. You didn't bring your gun, did you? Sure I did. Why? No, wait a minute. I... I'm not going to let you talk to Duke Moran with a gun in your pocket. Why not, Captain? Well, you... You might lose your temper and do something you'd regret. Oh, uh, what's the matter with your cap? I ain't gonna shoot anybody. I just want it in case Duke Moran gets tough. Oh, sure, I know, I know, but if he gets tough, you can handle him with your fists. Sure. Unless he tried to slip a knife through my ribs. Well, I... Ah, don't worry about the gun, Captain. I won't lose my head. <laughs> so Danny and Captain Fowler continue on their way toward the anchor pool room. Duke Moran's usual hangout, where Danny intends to have a showdown with Moran. But the captain is worried about Danny's gun, for he knows that Danny hates Moran to the core of his being. Now, look, son, I I hate to keep bringing this up, but, you know, I wouldn't go storming up to the Duke and start raising the devil. He borrowed money from me, and he ain't kept his word about paying it back. I know, I know, my boy, but... He'll pay it back. Oh, no, he won't. He's planning to skip town and leave me holding the sack. Now, look. You're working for me, Danny, and you're my best friend. And I... Well, I'm going along to back up your claims because I was a witness when the loan was made. But look here. I, I don't want to see you in no trouble. Oh, I'll take it easy. But I can tell you one thing. Hey, sir. look out for that hydra. Uh, oh, look, look up. Danny. Danny. Danny, you're hurt. Here, here, here. Let me help you. No. There. That's it now. Easy does it. Up now. There. There we are. Oh, nasty spill. You just sit here for a bit. Oh, you. You took a real header. Yeah? How do you feel, Danny? Yeah. Better let me see if you cut yourself. Uh, uh, keep your hands off me. Who are you? The... What? What is this? A, a stick up? Danny. Danny, are you kidding? Go away. Get away or I'll call the cops. Why? Danny, you're, you're out of your head. Get away. But but don't you know me? Let me alone. Let me alone. Oh, come back here. No, don't go away. Come back. Danny. Danny. <laughs> Danny breaks away and quickly disappears into the fog. For a quarter of an hour, Captain Fowler searches the vicinity and finally hurries on to the anchor pool room. Hey, hey, any of you guys here in the pool room seen Danny Price? Oh, hello there, Cap. No, I haven't seen Danny. Neither have I, Cap. Don't think he's been around. Oh, I see. Well, uh, is is Duke Moran here? The Duke? He was here a minute ago. Where'd he go, George? Out in the alley, I think. Yeah, that's right. Some guy opened the back door and called him. Some guy opened? Uh-huh. But tell me, tell me, was it Danny? Uh, I don't know. I don't know either, Captain. We didn't pay no attention to who it was. Oh, I see. Well, 
Okay, boys. Thanks. Later that night, groping his way along the waterfront, Captain Fowler arrives at the box office of the Crystal Motion Picture Theater. An attractive girl is selling tickets. Hello, Faye. Well, hello there, Captain. Going to the show? Oh, no, not tonight, Faye. I, I'm looking for Danny. Have you seen him? No, I haven't. And I'm sore at that big lug, too. He promised faithfully he'd be here to take me home, and it's time to close the box office right now. Well, look, Faye, I, I don't want to excite you, but I, I've got to tell you something. Danny's had an accident. An accident? Yeah. He fell down on the street. He tripped over a fire hydrant, and when he got up, you know what happened. He couldn't remember nothing. He was walking around someplace in a daze. Good heavens. Yes, I was with him when it happened, but I, I couldn't hang on to him. He, he ran off and left me, and I, I've been looking for him ever since. Would you tell the police? No. Well, for heaven's sake, tell them, Captain. Maybe they can find him. No, Faye, I, I don't want to tell the cops. Why not? There's a certain reason, and I don't want to talk about it here. Look, you wait here till I check in the cash. It'll only take a few minutes. I'll be right with you. All right, Faye. All right, Captain, now tell me. Why didn't you notify the police? Because... Because Danny's got a gun on him. Oh. Yes. He was on his way to see Duke Moran. You know about that money. Oh, yes. And he was afraid the Duke might start something. I see. You say you've been looking for Danny? Yes, I've been everywhere. Been to the casino, over to the bowling alley. Uh, have you been to Fred's cafe? Well, no. Well, Danny goes there for coffee sometimes. Well, all right. We, we'll take a look. Fred's cafe, why, it's in the next block, ain't it? Yeah. Oh, I tell you, Faye, we got to find that kid... He's like a crazy man. You know what he did? He looked me right in the face and he didn't know me. Oh, my goodness. Captain, suppose his memory never does come back. Oh, no, 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 Faye, don't, don't carry on like that. And don't you start worrying. Yeah, oh. I know how you feel. You and Danny engaged to be married and all, but don't you worry. I think everything will turn out all right. Oh, I hope. Hey, wait! Listen. What's your hurry, folks? That's Danny. Well, sure it is. You going to a fire or something? I've been chasing you for a block. Oh, Danny. Hiya, Faye. Oh, Danny, you're all right. Oh, sure. Sure, I'm all right. Except I... Well, I'm kind of mixed up. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in the Clark Hotel. And I don't remember going there at all. The Clark Hotel? Yeah. Well, so that's where you've been. Well... Seems to me I was walking along with you, Cap. Of course you were, Danny. Don't you know what happened? You had a lapse of memory. Huh? Yeah, we've been worried to death about you. The captain and I were looking for you. Oh, Danny, I'm so glad you're all right. Oh, so I, I've been off my noggin. <laughs> sure. Don't you remember falling over that fire hydrant? Fire hydrant? Yes, that's what no. did it, Danny. When I helped you up, you, you thought I was a stick-up man. You ran off down the street. Well, I'll be darned. How long ago did this happen, Cap? Well, it's been an hour ago or more. You've been in the Clark Hotel all that time. Well, how should I know? When did you come to your senses, Danny? Well, just now. I'm sitting there in the lobby wondering what it's all about when I've seen you folks passing the window. Oh, swell. But look, Danny boy, you're going to a doctor right away. What do you mean, doctor? Well, your head, you must have struck it when you fell. Oh, my head's all right. Oh, now, please, don't put up an argument, Danny. Oh, now, look... Hey, here comes an ambulance. Maybe I better flag it down and crawl in. Huh? Oh, now, don't be smart. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's no ambulance. Well, it's a police car. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, come on. Never mind the police car. Danny, come over here under the light. Let me take a look at your head. Oh, now, look, Faye. I tell you, there's nothing wrong with Hey, hey, look. You see where that car's stopping? Huh? Over in front of the anchor pool room. Yeah? Well, wonder what's happened there. Well, I... I don't know. Well, forget it. No, no, no. I, I want to find out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Come on, Danny. Let's go over and see. All right, all right, you people. Get back now. Don't block the doorway. Hey, hey what's happened, officer? The guy's been killed. Shot. Yeah? Yeah. He just found his body out in back of the pool hall. Well, who was he? Do you know? Yeah, Duke Moran. <laughs> The 
Duke Moran murdered, killed on the very night that you, Danny, with hatred in your heart and a gun in your pocket, were on your way to demand your money. Could it be that after your mind went blank, you continued on to the anchor pool room? Look at your gun, Danny. If no shots have been fired, you're all in the clear. <laughs> Did I kill him? Did I kill him? Did I kill him? <laughs> Come on, Danny, let's go. Well, how do you like that? That guy gets bumped off owing me a hundred bucks. Yep, and you can kiss that dough goodbye. And how? Captain, who do you suppose killed Moran? Well, how should I know? Didn't have any enemies that I know of. Except Danny. What do you mean, except Danny? I wasn't the guy's enemy. I, I just wanted my money back, that's all. Sure, sure, I know. You know what? But you just wanted your money back? What are you getting so excited about? Hey, boys, let's not walk down this way. There's no doctor in this direction. Oh, Faye, will you let up on that doctor thing? I tell you, there's nothing wrong with my head. How do you know? Well, anyhow, I ain't going to no doctor this time of the night. Tomorrow, maybe. My head starts aching or something. Is that a promise? Oh, okay, that's a promise. Hey, uh, Danny. Yeah? You know, I went to that pool hall right after you disappeared. I thought maybe I'd find you there. Yeah? Was I there? No, no, you wasn't. I asked about Moran, and they said he'd just gone out in the alley. Somebody opened the back door and called him. Why, Captain, you must have been there just before the murder. Sure looks like it. I'm sorry now I didn't go out and back and see who Moran was with. It's a shame you didn't. Yeah. Hey, uh, Danny, I, I've been wondering... All right, go ahead and say it. It was me that called him out and back. It was me that killed him. Why, Danny. Well, that's what he's thinking, Faye. I can see it sticking out all over him. Danny, you mustn't say that. He knows I've been out of my head for an hour. Can't remember a thing, so now he's trying to pin a crime on Shut me. Shut up, you fool. Shut up. Why should I want to pin a crime on you? That's what I'd like to know. What if you did kill Moran? I'm not holding it against you. You couldn't be blamed. You was off your nut. Well, I didn't kill him. How do you know? I didn't. I know I didn't. Yes, but how do you know? Oh, Don't... Captain, use your head. Danny lost his memory, and that includes his memory of Moran and his grudge against Moran and everything. Sure. So now what do you got to say? Well, maybe that grudge was in the back of your mind, Danny. Even while your memory wasn't working. Oh, you see, Faye, he's bound to make out I did it. Oh, no such thing. But look here, if you was mixed up in this murder, Danny, it's up to me to help you. I'm your friend. And I gotta find out about it, Danny. Let me see your gun. Huh? Let me see your gun. Now oh, the devil with you. Let him see it, Danny. That'll settle everything. Well, all right. Sure. Sure, he can see it. There you are, Captain. Thanks, Danny. Well, the barrel smells of powder. Are you crazy? And two slugs have been fired, Danny. Look here. All right, so the gun's been fired. And that means I killed Moran, I suppose. You're crazy, I tell you. He's right, Captain. That gun doesn't prove a thing. He might have fired those shots anywhere for no reason at all. Sure, I've been out of my head, ain't I? Don't you worry, Danny boy. You didn't kill Moran. Of course I didn't. You couldn't have done a thing like that. Not even in a trance. So don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Don't worry, Danny, darling. Poor Faye. She doesn't believe her own brave talk. Deep down in her heart, she's afraid. Afraid that Danny is a killer. It is nearly midnight now. Danny and Captain Fowler have returned to their boat, the fishing boat Dolphin in the harbor. Danny sits on the deck, gazing morosely into the fog. Well, hadn't you better turn in, kid? You ought to get some sleep. Oh, I couldn't sleep. Stick here a minute, will you, Cap? I'd like to talk to you. Well, sure. I, I'm sorry I blew my top the way I did when we was ashore. Oh, that's all right, Danny. I know you was thinking of my interest when you asked to see the gun. Well, sure I was. All kidding aside, it... Looks pretty much like I bumped off Moran, doesn't it, Cap? Well, Danny, to be honest with you, it does. Still, there's room for doubt. And if I was you, I'd lay low and say nothing. And I know one thing. I could never be convicted of murder, even if I did do it. Why not? Because I was suffering from amnesia. Yeah. The trouble is, how are we going to prove that? How are we going to prove it? Well, couldn't you prove it? You was there when it happened. You saw me go slug nutty. Well, sure, but who's going to believe me? I'm your friend. They think I was lying to save your neck. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. The things look pretty bad then, don't they? Ah, oh, now look, Danny. Don't go hanging yourself in advance. You know, maybe it's like Faye said. Maybe you just happened to fire them shots. Hey, listen. Hmm? I hear a motorboat. <laughs> so what? It's coming this way. Hear it? Well, 
Yeah, sure, sure, I hear it. It's the cops. They're coming here to ask questions. Oh. I'm getting out of here, Captain. No, 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 you keep your shirt on. I'll hail the boat and find out who it is. Now, you wait right here. Ahoy there! Ahoy! Who is it? It's me, Joe Rodriguez. Oh, there you are, Danny. It's only Portuguese Joe. What's he doing out here this time of night? Well, I don't know. Here is my life, Captain. You make me fast. I'm coming aboard. Okay, Joe. How'd you know we'd be up this late? Yeah. They just took a chance, Danny. But I am glad you are up. Oh, don't tell me you ran out of live bait again. Oh, no. I got plenty of live bait. Oh? What can we do for you, Joe? Captain, I got a little business proposition I would like to talk over with Danny. And I would like to talk to him private. Private? Oh, now, wait a minute. Anything you got to say to me, you can say in front of the captain. Oh, no, Denny. This is private. Very private. Oh, see, well, that's okay, kid. I, I'll go below. I was about to turn in anyway. Thanks, you, Captain. Oh, don't keep him up too long, Joe. He needs some sleep. Uh, I'd just be a few minutes, Captain. Good night. Good night. Well, what's on your mind? Denny, I ain't fed up with East Town. Business is rotten here. I want to go to Seattle. Yeah? And I need a little money, Danny. Two hundred dollars. And I want for you should let me have it. Are you kidding? Ain't you got two hundred dollars? Sure. Sure I have, but I'm getting married in a few days. I need every cent I've got. Oh, yeah? The sweet young lady who works at the Crystal Theater, huh? You'll be very happy with her, Danny. <laughs> you bet I will. But you'll be much more happy if you give me the money so I can get out of town, Danny. What do you mean? I am your friend, Danny. And I do not wish to cause you any trouble. But I know something about you that nobody else in this world knows. Not one soul. Yeah? Yeah. Tonight I am in an alley. Behind the anchor pool room. There is much fog. But I can see a little bit because there is a light. I see you shoot to Moran. Twice. To the heart. You're a dirty liar. So, you see, then it's much better I should leave town. If I stay here, I might get drunk someday and forget I am your friend. <laughs> I might talk, Danny. You climb in that boat of yours and get back to shore. Go on or I'll throw you overboard. You come to see me tomorrow, huh? Before noon? If you don't come by noon, well, maybe I get drunk, huh? <laughs> Cap. Cap, you awake? Oh, oh, yes, yes, Dan. Well, there's no room for doubt now. I'm the guy that did it. What? How do you know? Portuguese Joe was an eyewitness. He was there in the alley, saw the whole thing. Oh, no, no, wait a oh, minute. Oh, that's right, Cap. A dirty rat came out here to blackmail me. Tried to shake me down for 200 bucks. Said I'd have to dig it up by tomorrow noon or he'd start talking. Well, I'll be darned. Kid, kid, I guess it's time we started doing some fast thinking. Now, that ain't necessary, Cap. I'm clearing out tonight. Go. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get panicky now. Now, let's, let's give it some thought. Oh, no, no, I'm on my way, Cap. No fooling. Well, well, where are you going? I don't know. I'm going for good. I won't be back. You won't be? Oh, now, look here. What about, what about Faye? What about your wedding? Well, that's just a broken dream, Cap. Oh, damn. Well, at least you're, you're going to see her before you go, ain't you? No. Well, Danny, what's the matter with you? It ain't fair of you to run out on Faye. It's the fairest thing in the world. I prolong the agony. There's got to be a clean break. Oh, but, but Faye's such a grand kid. And she'll wait for you. Faye's loyal. Yes, sir, Danny. After this thing blows over, you'll find Faye right here waiting for you. I don't want her to wait for me. And I ain't coming back. Can't you understand that? You think I'd marry Faye now? Me, a killer? Oh, yeah. I know. I but... love that girl. I wouldn't bring disgrace on her. And it would be disgrace even if I'd cleared myself of the charge. I'd still be a killer. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you would. Well, I guess there's no use talking to you. You won't listen to a word I say. No, Cap. I've made up my mind. 
I'm going to pack my grip now and go ashore. Mm. <laughs> ah, golly, kid, I sure hate to lose you. Yeah, I, I hate to go, too, Captain. You've been a prince to me. More like a brother than a boss. Well, all I can say is thanks, Danny. Even when you knew I was saving up my money to, to buy a boat of my own, to go into competition with you, you never said a word. Well, why should I? Oh, this is a free country. Every man has a right to advance himself. And uh, about Faye, I wish you'd explain to her. You know what to say. Well, not quite as good, as good a talker as you are, Danny, but I'll try. You know something, Cap? I wish you and Faye'd get married. I know you'd make her happy. Me and Faye? Oh, no, she wouldn't have me. Don't be too sure about that. She'll forget about me after a while. But explain things to her, will you? Well, okay, Danny. I'll try. I'll do my best. Well, I'm going to hit the first freight train out of town. So long, Captain. What are you doing here? Oh, Danny, I'm so glad I saw you. I was about to get a boat and go out to the Dolphin. Yeah? I've got some wonderful news for you. What? At least I think I have. What caliber is your revolver? Well, it's a 38. I thought so. Danny, you didn't kill him. You didn't kill Moran. He was shot with a 45. Huh? Yeah. I just came from the police hospital. They took the bu- bullets from Moran's body. They were bullets from a 45. Oh, no. No, no, that can't be right. It is right, Danny. Well, there's some mistake, honey. Look. I hadn't figured on telling you this, but there was an eyewitness to the murder. Portuguese Joe, the bait peddler. He's just been out to the boat trying to shake me down for some hush money. Well, he's a liar if he says you did it. Oh, no, honey. You got a bum steer about them bullets. I didn't, I tell you. I got it straight from the doctor. What's more, I've been to the Clark Hotel. The clerk said you were there for practically an hour, sitting by the window. That means you went there right after you left the captain, so you couldn't have been to the pool room. Well, I'll be darned. Now, look, Faye. Suppose you go out to the dolphin. Here, here, take this grip. Tell the captain what you just told me. And tell him I'm paying a visit to Portuguese Joe right now. this thing settled. Sure, sure. Don't you got your money? Joe, you didn't see me shoot Moran. Not then. I hope you're not going to put up no argument. You lied to me, and I'm here to get the truth. Now, look, Danny. Come on, admit it. You lied to me, didn't you? No. No, you shoot. No, you... Oh, oh, no, no. Let me go. Let me go. Don't shoot the living oh. daylights out of you, you rat. Oh. Come on. Come on, tell me you lied. You're going to come clean. You're going to give me the lowdown on this whole rotten business. Come on now, start talking. The fog has lifted now, and the eastern sky heralds the approach of dawn. As Danny returns to the dolphin, he finds Faye standing on the deck. Danny, I thought you'd never get back. It's almost daylight. Well, I had a long ways to go, honey. Joe lives way out at the end of the Channel Street Wharf. That's where his bait shack is. Well, what'd you find out? Did you face him with his lie? I sure did. Is the captain in his cabin? No, he's not. He's uh, gone ashore. Gone ashore? Danny, there's something wrong with the captain. He's been acting very queerly. Yeah? When I told him you'd gone to see Portuguese Joe, his, his face went as white as a sheet. 
Then he went over to his desk and wrote a note. Sealed it in an envelope and told me to give it to you when you come back. I'll bet I know what's in it. What? A confession. But I won't need it now. I got one from Joe. What do you mean? Honey, the captain's been framing me. Framing you? Yeah, that's right. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Remember he said he didn't go out and back at the pool hall to see who it was that called Moran out in the alley? Yes. Well, he lied. He did go out there. And he saw the murder committed. He knew who did it. Why, Danny. And right then, he got a bright idea. He figured he'd make me believe I committed that murder. So I'd take it on the land. Get out of town. You see, honey? Well, uh, uh, why would he do that? Because he was in love with you. What? Our wedding day was getting closer, and the captain was half crazy with jealousy. He wanted me out of the picture so that he could marry you. Oh, Danny, I can't believe that. It's true, honey. Joe told me. I'd have got a lot more out of Joe, too, only he broke loose from me and dived into the water. Last I seen of him, he was swimming away. Well, what, what about the murder? Did you find out who killed Moran? I got a hunch that Joe himself did it. After he left, I looked around his shack. And I found an I.O.U. there signed by the Duke. You did? Then the Duke owed Portuguese Joe money, too. Yep. And I figured the captain made Joe a proposition. If Joe'd come here and make me believe I was the killer, the captain wouldn't squeal on him. Sure, Danny. That makes sense. Well, I... I better see what the captain wrote. Yeah. Open it up, Danny. Uh, dear Danny, I suppose you know everything by now. I haven't got the nerve to face you, kid, so I'll be the one to hit the freight. You won't need to save any more money for that boat. I've signed over the dolphin to you. You'll find the papers in my desk. Good luck, Danny. And make Faye a good husband. Yes, the captain was the villain in our story. But wait, what about Danny's gun with the two empty shells? That doesn't fit into our solution at all. Or does it? Remember when the captain and Danny were on their way to the pool hall and Danny stumbled over the hydrant? The fog was pretty thick, you know. The captain didn't have a bit of trouble in slipping that gun out of Danny's pocket. He wanted to make sure Danny didn't use it on Moran. And later, after the captain had formulated his plot against Danny, it was a simple matter for him to fire a couple of shots from the gun and then slip it back into Danny's pocket when he met Faye and Danny on the street. Yes, the fog sometimes has its advantages. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Herbert Connor, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, same time, 9.15, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the unusual story of... Jealousy. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. 
Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange Wills Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle, Perry Ward with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast and the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Hate, Jealousy, anger, revenge, envy, greed, and lust. And here is our distinguished star of radio, screen, and stage, Warren William. Strange wills are stories of strange and unusual testaments, many of which, when read between the lines, bring to light stories of dramatic intensity that defy our imagination. Names, places, and time have all been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons living or dead. The masterpieces of fiction pale in comparison to the stark drama found in man's last official act on earth, his last will and testament. You'll see what I mean in just a moment, but first, let's listen to a few words from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Treasure to Starboard. This is a story of sunken treasure, of blood-red rubies, sparkling diamonds, and lustrous pearls. But these were but a part of this priceless treasure trove. There were golden statues of pagan gods encrusted with precious stones. There were amethysts, opals, and gold. 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 On the night of March 12th, in the year 1703, some 400 miles off the coast of the West Indies, the Spanish three-master Toledo was foundering in the grip of a tremendous hurricane. In his cabin, Captain Fernandez was hurriedly drafting his last will and testament. 
he and his crew knew that death rode the gigantic waves and that hope of survival was an improbability. I consign my body to the elements and my soul to the loving and tender arms of the Holy Mother and to some valiant adventurer whose heart beats with a lost of a Midas. I give the treasure on board my ship. Our position is longitude oest. We're about to burn the ship, Captain. Hurry, hurry! No, Jose, I shall stay. Go, all of you, and may heaven protect you. For over 200 years, men have been searching for the treasure aboard the Toledo. But not one clue was ever found until one afternoon... A young, dashing, seafaring friend of mine, Captain Paul London, called me from some little island in the West Indies. I can't tell you more than that, John. I'm afraid of eavesdroppers. But I know I'm on the right track. Now, I'll do just as I say, and I'll expect you both here next Sunday. So long, John. So Paul had discovered a clue to the treasure ship Toledo. Phew! It had me excited. I could see quarts of rubies, packs of diamonds... Well, who wouldn't get excited? I lost no time in contacting the person whose name he had given me. A certain Gene Medford. Hello? I'd like to speak to Mr. Gene Medford, please. The name is right, but the sex is wrong, mister. (laughs) What do you mean? I happen to be a female. A girl one. And a rather pretty one, too. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford... I had no idea when I talked with Paul. Paul? Paul, you haven't talked with Paul London, have you? Less than ten minutes ago. He called me from some little town called Rosarita. Oh, and just what has the traveling Mr. London got up his sleeve today? (laughs) And by the way, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. (laughs) Of course, I'm sorry. I am John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law, and a personal friend of our mutual friend. Oh, well, that's better. Now then, Mr. O'Connell, what does the great Paul want this time? It's quite a large order, my lady. He wants you to prepare and pack a great deal of special equipment. Now, let's see. Where's the list he gave me? Oh, here it is. Your filtered ultraviolet light machine. A quantity of hydrothiocyanic acid. Well, all the materials and gadgets one uses in the examination of questioned uh, documents. And after I've done all that, then what do I do, please? Then, my dear Miss Medford, I am to take you to the airport and fly you bodily to the lair of Paul London. Why, that's ridiculous. I simply won't be let off by the nose on any wild goose chase of his. No, I refuse. I won't go. <laughs> Paul is on on the trail of a buried treasure, Miss Medford. And I can guarantee you that if you're a good girl and come peacefully, that perhaps, perhaps before this is over, you can wear rubies on your nightgown and dissolve real pearls in your bath. Rubies on my nightgown and pearls in my bath? Hmm. When do we start? Tomorrow night. I'll pick you up about five, and then we're off to high adventure. Fasten your seatbelt, Jean. We're over Rosarita, and I don't know what kind of a field this is going to be. Gee, I'm excited. Take it easy now. No crash landing. My nerves are on edge. Uh, So am I. Hang on. We're going down. I'm ready. I found this little nautical museum here quite by accident, and I ran across something that made my hair stand on end. In one of the exhibits, I found two pieces of evidence that sent me to the telephone and my call to John. Well, for heaven's sake, don't keep us in suspense any longer, Paul. What's in this exhibit that makes you think you know where the Toledo lies? Wait, wait, John. Talk in a whisper. There are some strange-looking characters on the loose in this country. We can't be too careful. This news ever got around... Looking for an alibi already, Paul? No, of course not. I'll tell you what I found. I found the water-soaked log of the Toledo. Every word has been washed out by seawater except the ship's name carved on the cover. Ah, I'm beginning to see the light, and uh, and Jean here with all her paraphernalia. That's right. Modern science will let us read that log. And if the captain of the Toledo lived up to the code of the sea... We will find the position of his ship when she went down. Well, so far, so good. But how does Paul intend to get the log? You'll leave that to my gentle uh, but persuasive administrations. The main thing is this. I'm going to get possession of the log of the Toledo for one night only. 
Gene, I want you to set up your apparatus here in this hotel room and wait until I return. Well, how about me, Skipper? Need any help? No, John, I think I can handle this alone. Remember now, I'll be back in two hours. Have everything ready. And supposing the handsome male lead shouldn't come back? <laughs> well, in that event, simply fold your tent like the Arabs. And uh, silently steal away. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Jean worked feverishly the next hour, getting her chemicals and equipment set up for this exciting moment. And then, quite suddenly... Will you see who it is, please, John? Don't let anyone come in. Very well. Paul! (gasps) Good heavens, you're wounded! Here, let me help you. Paul! Oh, Paul, what happened? The log did... I'm all right. Got hit in the shoulder, but, but I've got it. Look. Oh, here, give it to me. John, help Paul get his shirt off. I'll get some antiseptic. Sit down on the bed, Paul. Here. I'll rip this shirt off your shoulder. Easy now. It's just a flesh wound, John. Don't worry about it. What worries me is the the man who took the shot at me. Did you recognize him? No. no. I got a good look at his face, too. He was blonde, solid, had a German face. You don't imagine someone else? Well, I don't know, John, but there's that chance that someone else is as smart as I. Bragging again, huh? Here, now, let me see that wound. Well, no bone smashed. It could have been worse. Hold still while I wash it. Oh. Oh. Sissy, now hold still. Oh. Now a bandage. And in two minutes, I'll have you ready to lick your weight in wildcats. <laughs> the way I feel just now, those wildcats would have to be about two days old. <laughs> Jean worked far into the night, and without success. Her ultraviolet light proved valueless. Photographs taken of the pages with infrared brought only blank negatives. All of us were frantic. Towards dawn, Jean looked up from her work. Gentlemen, I think I'm a flop. I can't bring out a single word that's ever been written on this paper. It's hopeless, I guess. Oh, Paul. I feel terrible about letting you down. Never mind, Jean. Don't feel too badly. Wait. Wait a minute. Here. There's one more chance. John, get me a handful of soot out of the fireplace. Put it in this dish for me. One handful of soot coming up. Thank you. Now, John, come over to the table with me. Paul, you lie there and rest. Okay, Duchess. I'm going to plug in this special ray lamp. It throws a pinhole light. It must be parallel to the page in the log. If there's one single solitary indentation left, it'll bring it out. Now then, Mr. Barrister, out with the lights. I'll take a page at random for our experiment. Hand me this soot, please. One order of soot. Over, easy. You can't see this, Paul, but I'm blowing a pinch of soot over the page. Just a very fine coating. It'll work its way into any depression on the page. Now I'm letting the pinhole of light traverse across the page. Look, Jean. I see a part of a letter forming. It makes a distinct shadow under the light. It's working. It's working. Take it easy. It's too too early to crow. Say, if you think I'm going to lie here on the bed while you two solve the mystery of the log of the Toledo, you're both nuts. It is working. Look, look, there's an S. A, Y. Oh, good. Now I'm going over to the back of the book and work forward. We've got to find the final entry. More so, please, lots more. Page after page. Page after page. Our faces were drawn and haggard. And then... Here it is. I've raised some more shadows. Oh, Paul, John. We found the last page of the log... The next few minutes will tell the story. It looks like a number. It is. It's it's a six and a two after it. Sixty-two. That must be longitude. Yes, of course, longitude, 62 degrees. Here comes the rest. What is it, Jean? It looks like a one. I can't be sure. And the next number is... Um... Uh, oh. You will remain seated, please. Carlos, turn on the light. See me, Commandant. If you would avoid personal danger, you will not attempt to interfere. You see, I am armed. Mm -hmm. Good. Now then, permit me to introduce myself. I am Herr Gustav Richter, late U-boat commander in the German Navy. Well, for... Were we supposed to say Heil Hitler? The war is over, the big one. But unless you leave this island immediately, a new one will start. Because, as you might know, we are both after the same thing. Now then, Carlos, you will take the book from the young lady's hands. Si, senor. Fräulein, the last number you are trying so hard to read. Maybe it's best if you don't find it. It will save us all a lot of trouble. 
I keep Commandante, the book. Herr Richter, there are international rules of law governing... Quiet. It. There are also local laws providing against breaking into and stealing public documents. I warn you most seriously. The treasure of the Toledo will be mine, and mine alone. If you should be foolish enough to interfere, I don't have to tell you what will happen. Thank you, and good night. Well, of all the crazy... Take it easy, Paul. He looks like he might be serious. Evidently, you weren't the only one who found the clue to the lost Toledo. I can see those rubies on my nightgown walking right out of the window. And those pearls in my bath. I knew it sounded too good. Not yet, Jean. I think that Herr Gustav Richter, late commander of the German Navy, is going to have some rough sailing ahead before he finds the sunken treasure. And by everything that's holy, we three are going to give it to him. <laughs> Part two of Strange Wills will continue in just a moment. Now back to Warren William and Treasure to Starboard. For the next three days, the cables between our island home and New York were kept exceptionally busy. Before the end of the week, huge quantities of deep-sea diving gear were being flown into Rosarita. We tried to trace our German friend, but he couldn't be found. I felt certain that we'd meet Herr Richter again, but I hoped we'd be more than ready for him. About two weeks later, when the last of our equipment was delivered, we called a meeting of our augmented crew, who were hired to man our ship. Some of them were imported from the States. They wore campaign ribbons, and, <laughs> well, you know our sailors. And we've got to be prepared for everything. Our ship is a floating arsenal as well as a scientific laboratory. Our treasure prize is high, and every one of us will share it if we find it. Are you ready? You, you bet we are, are, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, then. We'll leave port in an hour. I'll see you all on board. In the captain's quarters aboard our ship, Paul, Jean, and I had another meeting. I've got it all figured out to almost a mathematical certainty. I can bring this ship within ten miles of where the Toledo went down. The rest is pure luck. Do you think the Jerry's know we sailed, Paul? That I don't know, but the word will get back to Herr Richter. Don't you worry. Maybe he's already on the way. But so what? How's he going to get there? Maybe he has a ship. Maybe he can use his sub. I don't know that. But getting there and staying there are going to be two different things. He'll find out. We spent two quiet, uneventful days sailing to our destination. If it hadn't been for the tenseness on board, I could have had a lovely time. But with diamonds, rubies, and buried treasure, and a battle in the offing... Well, how could anyone hope to rest? Near the end of the second day... Come in. Just picked up this message, sir. It's from the SS Juniper, bound for Boston. Thank you. SS Juniper reports sighting a strange submarine at 14 o'clock. Craft heading northeast by east. Refused to reply to radiogram. May possibly be an escaped Nazi sub... Be alert. Huh. Well, there's our answer. Herr Richter's on the way. 
And we better be ready tomorrow when we meet him on the floor of the ocean. We arrived at our calculated position sometime during the light and lay to. No sooner had we dropped our anchors than the crew took to the boats and began sounding operations to determine the depth of the water around us. They reported just at dawn. From 30 to 90 fathoms, sir. We found a sharp decline about a quarter mile east. We were unable to reach bottom at that point, but our charts show this to be a part of the Great Fissure, one of the deepest points in the entire Atlantic. Thanks, Pete. Tell the first mate that I'll go down as soon as I've had breakfast. Tell him to have the gear ready. Aye, aye, sir. After breakfast, Paul donned his gear and went over the side. Jean and I stood by the air pump and wondered what would happen below. Was the sub lying there? Would they locate the rotting hull of the Toledo? Would they find the treasure before us? These were anxious moments. Paul kept in constant touch through our sea phone. Paul? Paul, can you hear me? Still going down. Getting darker. Turning on my pressure light. Now on the bottom. Oh, John, so far so good. Yes, Jean, so far so good. The wreck ahead, not our ship, has two stacks circling to avoid fouling airline. Reach the edge of the outer fissure. We'll follow it. Water beyond fissure, very black, very deep. Oh, Paul, darling, don't talk like that or I'll make you come right up. <laughs> I'll be careful, sweetheart. Just past the shark. He sends his regards to Johnny Weismuller. <laughs> we'll see that he doesn't send you along for a greeting card. Oh, I see a wreck on the edge of the great fissure. An old one, covered with sand. Send down sand gun on rope. It's coming right down, darling. Quick, he wants a sand gun sent down to him. It's on the way, Paul. Be careful now. Going to blow a little sand away to see if I can discover the identity of the ship. John. John, come here, please. Listen. Listen to the phone. Do you hear anything? Let me listen. Paul. Paul, this is John. Listen. Come up at once. The sub is in the vicinity. We've just picked up the sound vibrations. Hurry, man. Hurry. I feel it too, John. Just a minute more. I'm getting a piece off this old hull. I'll bring it up. Okay, I've got it. Race away. Start the wind. She's coming up. Hurry. Three minutes of maddening delay, and then I saw his helmet break water. As busy hands unbolted his helmet, he gave us a little net, which he held in his hand. We took it eagerly, and there it was. A piece of old, decayed wood. But on it was a small brass plate, some old, rusted fitting that had uh, seen the ocean bottom for many a year. I gave it to Jean, and she hurried to the laboratory to take off the corrosion. Naturally, I hurried with her. It's coming off. I can almost make it out, John. Let me see. There's an L, an O, T. Here it is, Toledo. The Toledo. We found it. We found it. Oh, John, I'm so happy. Let's hurry and tell Paul. After Paul came out of the decompression chamber, he told us his story. He's lying at the very edge of the fissure. You must be very careful or it's possible that it may disappear entirely. There are tons of sand to be blown out, and then, well, then we'll know the answer. But what about the sub, Paul? Good heavens, you don't mean to start blowing out sand with a mad German sitting alongside of you. Well, we have to take that chance. I think we're better equipped, and if we work fast, we can be out of here in two days. Even before he finds out where the Toledo is lying. Right now, we have to float a buoy over the spot and pull out of here. Maybe we can throw them off the track. We'll come back later and then go to work. Under the cover of darkness, we crept back to our position. Paul and two divers went over the side to begin the hazardous task of uncovering the ship. We agreed on complete silence, unless an emergency arose. I'll never forget how long that night lasted. Along about midnight, our worst fears were realized. Jean, Jean, the sub is on the prowl. Listen. We've got to let him know. We've got to warn him. Yes, yes, tell him. Paul? Paul? Can you hear me? Paul? Can't stop the talk now, but we're an inside ship. They'll 
covered iron chests. Hold on. He won't listen, John. He won't listen. Wait a minute. John. I can't... I can't hear the sob. It stopped. Probably gone out of range. Treasure to starboard. Treasure to starboard. We found the treasure of the Toledo. Did you hear, John? They found it. They found the treasure of the Toledo. Paul? Paul, answer me. Paul? Oh, John, something's gone wrong. The line's dead. Paul, answer. Are you all right? Paul? Paul? Five interminable minutes dragged by on leaden feet. Not a sound came from Paul or from the divers down there with him. What had happened? How could we know? Then... They came out of the escape hatch. They're surrounding... Take this phone, John. Don't stop listening for a moment. Jean ran the length of the ship and disappeared. Paul's position was most precarious. We couldn't drop a depth charge. We couldn't do anything to help. I kept trying to reach Paul on the phone, but the line was apparently dead. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a diving helmet disappear over the side of our ship. I looked round for Jean. She was gone. And then I realized, too late, that she... I gave the earphones to a sailor and ran down the deck. Who was that? Went over the side just now. That was Miss Medford, sir. She insisted on going down. You fool! Why did you let her do that? Well, she said she was the only one who knew how to detonate the underwater bomb, sir. So that was it. Little Jean Medford going down to lick the sub crew single-handed. What a fool. What a brave, glorious little fool. I prayed as I had never prayed before. Everyone aboard leaned over the side of the ship, silently looking down into the dark blue of the water. What was happening down there? Then, 200 yards off our stern, we saw an oil slick spread on the surface. She'd done it. She'd destroyed the sub. And what of the crew? It was either surrender or death. Later, Paul told us the story. We saw them coming at us just after we'd uncovered the treasure. They had special equipment, compressed air helmets without airlines attached. They held long steel pikes in their hands. In the glow of our lights, we could see the outline of the sub. I thought sure it was curtains, till I saw someone sneak up to the sub and drop something down the escape hatch. The explosion knocked us all flat. Then I looked around. I saw the sub roll on its side, and the Toledo, well, she'd entirely disappeared. The blast had sent it tumbling down the fissure. The treasure went with it. And the Germans? <laughs> For all I know, they're still walking back to land. And so ended the quest for treasure to starboard. Jean didn't get her rubies and pearls after all, but she's still very well satisfied because shortly after we returned to the States... And do you, Jean Medford, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband through sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, until death do you part? I do. Then by virtue of the authority vested in me, I pronounce you man and wife. Darling. Well, I did manage to get one diamond anyway, didn't I, dearest? Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you more about Treasure to Starboard. But first, here is a word from your announcer. Here again is Warren William. Little did Captain Fernandez realize as he wrote his last will and testament in the ship's log on the night of March 12, 1703, that over 200 years later, men would still fight and die to recover the treasure that went down with him to the bottom of the sea. Will the treasure of the Toledo ever be relocated? 
Well, it depends on science and the brave daring of intrepid adventurers. We've managed to reach the stratosphere. Why not the unknown depths of the sea? Especially when it holds not one, but hundreds of treasures of inestimable value. Who will risk their lives to recover them? Will you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story about a professor who believed that heredity is stronger than environment. Unfortunately, he put his nefarious belief to an actual test that involved the life of an innocent child. In order to prove his point to a doubting scientific world, the professor married a woman in whose veins coursed criminal blood for many generations. From this unholy union, a child was born, born to be reared as a lady. But from the very first, Strange signs of bad blood cropped up in the child. What happened to her? Well, listen next week to the story we call One Shining Hour. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Tellaways feature produced in Hollywood. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. Let us join old Nancy, witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. Hannah and eleven year old I be today. Yes, the Hannah and eleven year old. And now, Satan, if everybody will just douse out them lights and make it nice and dark, we'll get right down to business. Draw up to the fire and gaze into them buds. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see the hands of time turn back for honor gear. Soon you'll be up in the ocean off the Cape of Good Hope that's down in Africa. There, up on the stormy waters, rolls a ship whose captain's name is Vanderdecken. That's his name now, 
<laughs> but soon he'll be called by sailor men the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> the Flying Dutchman. <laughs>
If might be in all thy heaven, I shall kill thy man. I shall set thy storm. I shall round thy cursed cape. Oh! 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 And lightning, it has struck the ship. It was sent by God. The jail hath died to silence. Look, in the bow, a blinding light was sent by heaven. Hey. Yay. Oh! Oh! Hey. What? Who art thou who has taken shape with a dark, dazzling glow? I am a messenger. God hath deigned to answer thee, John van der Decken. I, I did not mean to... Fall upon thy knees and hearken to thy doom. Spare me. Spare my life. Thou shalt not die. To live shall be thy curse. In the teeth of a gale shalt thou fly forever, always seeking father, never reaching forth. A phantom ship of death shall be thy home. Thy crew shall be the blackened souls of sinners of the sea. Thou, their master and their slave, shall be alone of flesh and blood. Behold thy living tomb as it rises from the depths. Oh, oh, nay! Nay, nay, not on that! It is a hulk of horror! It is thy eternal home! Oh, nay, I beg! It is a nightmare ship! Black as night with sails, the hue of blood. Oh. oh, please, oh, please. Grinning fleshless specters line its rails. Oh. oh, nay, nay. Forgive, oh, Father. Holy priest, thou art a man of God. Intercede and beg for me. Ah, oh. oh, I am forced. Forced upon this awful bark. Have pity. Have pity. Oh. Stay, messenger of God, I pray thee, wait. No soul is ever lost. Even this man's can be saved, redeemed. His soul is black with selfish pride. Only love can wash it clean. He will need man's love to find love. His fate has been decreed. What man here will share his doom to aid him in the search? I, Father. Think well, old man. Thy days of earthly strife are numbered. Thy reward and rest at hand. If thou wouldst teach him love, thou too must sail upon this ghostly bark, a living man amongst the dead. I am ready. I go with thee, son. And flesh and blood, thou givest me the life I would have taken from thee. Oh, foolish soul. And thou didst say all living creatures were selfish as thyself. Thy curse was to be eternal, but this good man's sacrifice hath won thee again to hope of heaven. I shall not have to sail. Thou shalt sail upon yon bark, as I have said. But once, each seven years, thy phantom ship may touch a port, and thou, for the space of a single moon, may seek for love thyself and cleanse thy soul of pride. Come, my son. I come. Seven years and not the day. Ever flying into the gate. And then a port for a single moon. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Two hundred years of maybe on this ghastly ship of death. Ever flying into the gale. Thirty times and nine have I been in port for a single moon. And now the hour draws nigh when I shall rest on shore again. And bitterness is in thy soul, John. Thy heart is filled with plans of evil for thy visit amongst men. Aye, I shall employ this moon ashore to bring dishonor, death, destruction in my path. No, have the centuries of suffering taught thee nothing? Yeah, by example of thy God, they have taught me how to hate for I have endured his awful vengeance. Oh, vengeance on thee hath never been his purpose. His plan is thy regeneration. So this loving father destroys his son with a curse of living death to save him. Uh, oh, cease thy lying sophistry. My centuries of pain have confirmed the truth I knew of old, that love is but a lie, and that self is all that matters. Yet for two hundred years and eighty, I years and eighty, I years and eighty, I years and eighty, I have been my comrade on this phantom ship of death. And how at first I... Phantom ship of death. And how at first of thine. I believe was love that made thee share my awful fate. Ah, but my brain at last searched out the truth. 
That which is worse than death to me meant to be, but long worse than death to me meant to be, but long worse than death to me meant to be, but long as life. Thou art old, about to die. Thy seeming sacrifice has let thee live almost three centuries beyond thy span. Oh, John, I pity thee. Oh, John, I pity thee. How more than blind are they who will not see? Oh, pity me not. Listen, priest. Thirty times and nine now have I gone ashore. For one great fleeting moon in each long seven years. Each time I have been humble, seeking that love which now I know doth not exist. Everywhere I found distrust and looks and fear. But though men knew not that I am he, they call the flying Dutchman. They sense I am a being set apart. I am of the dead who live. And in mine eyes men see the horror stamped by centuries of pain. Thirty times and nine I sought for love and found but hate. And now I shall employ my moon ashore to pay. Our Catholic ship draws into port. Again for a moon I join the world of men who worship thy revengeful God. And I shall bring dishonor, death, destruction in my path. Dost hear me, God? Dost hear me, God? Dost hear me, God of vengeance? I go ashore to pay thee for my curse. I go ashore to pay. <laughs> I have a vast day, Satan. We'll tell folks what the flying Dutchman did when he went ashore the 40th time. <laughs> Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. So just douse out them lights. We'll spin you the finish of our yarn about that famous sailor man we begun the last time you was here. Yeah. That's right, Satan. We told how that fella Vanderdecken, for his blasphemy against his lord, was condemned to sail the seas until his selfish soul is cleansed by love which he's allowed to come ashore and look for once each seven years. Well, sir, the help him in his search, a good old priest volunteered to share his curse, but his help didn't do much good. For when we left them, uh, but, but draw up to the fire and gaze into them, hear for yourselves just how we left this Vanderdecken. <laughs> Thirty times and nine now have I come ashore. 
For one brief fleeting moon in each long seven years. Thirty times and nine I sought for love and found but hate. And now I shall employ my moon ashore to bring dishonor, death, destruction in my path. Dost hear me, God of vengeance? I go ashore to pay thee for my curse. I go ashore. <laughs> now gaze into them was deep and hear the finish of my yarn. About the flying Dutchman. <laughs> the flying Dutchman. <laughs> Henry, in this enlightened year of 1810, even such an old sea dog as you can't believe the forecastle yarn of the flying Dutchman. Well, out there in Portsmouth Harbor lies my proof. That ship's a Dutchman's ride, a mother's son. No, Uncle Henry, you merely say that because it's a dingy-looking old hulk you didn't see come in last night. I tell you, no one saw that ship come in. And I tell you, I recognize it. For an eye 300 year, every sailor man upon the seven seas has seen that black two-decker fly by him at least once. In a dead calm, I've seen it cross our bows like lightning. Backwards. We'd never stay and sail straight out again a gale. While we on a human ship couldn't even smell a breeze. Are you sure you hadn't been sampling the ship's rum barrel when you saw all that? Yes, <laughs> yes I am. <laughs> if, 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 if that out there's a natural ship, why don't we see hide or hair of any living creature on its rails around the yard? Oh, oh, look, Uncle Henry. There's a small boat coming from our port side now. Well, I'll be... Now, when did they launch that? Why, you were so busy talking. And there's two men in it. Two living men is all the ghost ship carries. But neither of those men or their clothing look three centuries old. And you say that's the flying Dutchman, Dave. The Dutchman don't grow any older. That's part of his curse. And neither does the priest who travels with him. He gets new clothes when they come to shore every seven years. That means a land about here, I think. Well, I'm leaving before they do. You and Judy better come, too. Nonsense. All right. But I'm a warning you to have nothing to do with a big fella coming in that small boat. Henry, such superstition is unchristian-like. Show you what I think of your ridiculous fears. I'm going to invite those men to be my guests. What? Peter Cooper, you're going to take them into your house? If they care to come. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> why, the Dutchman's a holy devil. You make me hope that big man in the boat is your flying Dutchman, Uncle Henry. He sounds interesting. He, he, he does. <laughs> they, they're, they're landing, Papa. And, and, and I'm a-going to pour the Dutchman's eyes light on me. Oh, He's a fright, and I tell you. Oh, look at Uncle Henry Ross. <laughs> My superstitious credulity almost discourages me with human kind. You're the stranger, Papa. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Greetings to the friends. Hi, greetings. Why didn't thou not run at my approach? Run? Why should we run? Yeah, thy companion did. Well, he, he, he had an appointment elsewhere. Well, gentlemen, as your strangers and our port of inns are not of the best, I wish to invite you to be my guest. I guess. Thank thee truly, but... Well, do not hesitate. I'm only an humble minister, but my daughter and I will strive to make you comfortable. Now, what a minister... A man of God, yes. And thou art his daughter. Yes. <laughs> a minister and his child. He thanks thee, sir, but my comrade and I cannot, uh, I guess. Say, we can, we shall. I thank thee, worthy servant of the Lord. I accept thy invitation gladly. Thou must not abuse the hospitality of this good man's house. Thou must not harm his child. I have uh, merely suggested that she take a walk with me this but afternoon. I know thou meanest wrong to her because she is the daughter of a man who serves the God you hate. I shall warn her and her father. Tell them who and what thou really art. Listen, fool. The tale of the flying Dutchman they call but idle superstition. Thou wilt tell these people nothing. They will not believe thee till I prove the words which thou would say, and then it will be too late. Are you ready for a walk? Aye, I come to thee, my child. Farewell, priest. Here I am back again for seven years of living death to the God of hate who hath condemned me. I have a sacrifice to make. Well, we're completely off the beaten track. Aye, should one 
die among these trees and thickets, it might be many months ere their body was found. What made you think of such an awful thing as that? The thought of Wow One who was left alive. A father, for instance, might suffer long and keenly ere his, uh, child's, for instance, fate was known. If I were lost, it would kill my father. <laughs> but of course, nothing will happen to me with you here to protect me. Hey, thou dost trust me. Of course I trust you. Thou art a child. Thy purity enables thee to read men's hearts. That's what my father said. And I know your heart is good, because in one whose eyes show such unhappiness, any evil that was there before must have been completely burned away. What would thee think if I taught thee different? Stop acting as though you meant to fight me, Captain. And sit down on this log. I... Come. I'm sorry. <laughs> I sit close beside thee. Thou hast never shown fear of me as others. Why should I show fear of you? Uh, no reason. Except that people always do. Captain, I think someone ought to talk to you. Of what? Yourself. I don't think you know yourself at all. No, that thing is not. I think you're the sort of man who thinks he's awfully bad and who tries to be bad. All because he's afraid to let folks see what's really underneath. So? Yes. You're exactly like a little boy who lives next door to us. When he's outside in the garden, he's always playing at being Indian and scalping people. Yet I've seen him through the window of his room at night when he thinks he's all alone, fondling his sister's dog. Thou sayest I resemble him? Exactly. I've seen him stand out in the rain when the lightning flashed and thunder roared just to prove how brave he is. And all the time I knew he wanted to hide his head in his mother's lap and cry with fear. You're exactly like him, Anthony. Well, I... But that's uh, just the way he glares at you. Oh, little fool, and I... And he's rude and ill-mannerly, just as you are. I... How long since you've seen your mother, Captain? I... I never saw her. Have any sisters? Nay. Ever married? Nay. In law? Nay. Well, that explains everything. You've never been brought up? What? You've had no one but God to go to with your troubles. No wonder your eyes show such unhappiness. For God must seem awfully far away sometimes to one who has no other friend. Yes, yes. How secluded this place is. One were lost here, they never would be found. Well, Captain, why don't you kill me as you planned? Yes. I wasn't very afraid. You see? I know the little boy next door. <laughs> Playing in here. Scouting people. Suppose you put your, <laughs> suppose you put your head in my lap and have a cry. Why? He does sometimes and no one else is here. Why? Seems to help. I don't think... You're crying in a long, long time. Why? 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 Oh. Father, forgive thy foolish child. Father, forgive thy foolish child. I hate to see you gentlemen go. Your fortnight here has brought us happiness. My ship awaits, Mr. Cooper. I cannot tarry longer. But my old friend here will stay ashore with thee. Jan, my son! This voyage I take alone. Thou wilt share my punishment no longer. Thou hast found us, Lord! I have found myself. I don't understand you, gentlemen. My comrade may explain when I am gone. And now, here I bid a last farewell, Mr. Cooper. May... May I kiss thy daughter once, as a father on the ground. I will answer that, John. Kiss me as a lover on the lips. I... Oh, I did not mean to speak. 
I do love thee, Judith. I do love thee. And I love thee. Oh, nay, child, love me not. Another will come to thee. One of thy age and goodness. One worthy of thy love. I want no one but you. But, John, take me with you on your voice. Nay, I cannot. Take thy arms from about me. I must go. Oh, no, John. Come back. Farewell. Oh, oh, John, wait. Your black ship is not ready. I see no sign of proof. They are waiting. Waiting for my coming. Oh, he's in the small boat. Leaving me. The ship flies through the waters by magic. Look, already he's reached the black ship's side. He's climbing up the ladder. He's aboard. Oh, the sails of these black ship sails. Yet there's no wind. It's putting off the sea. Farewell, my son, my comrade. Come back to me, John. I love you. And I love thee. Farewell forever. No. Not forever. Ah! His ship is... They're sinking beneath the waters. Listen. Oh, gracious Father, my prayers are answered. His long voyage is at an end. Thou hast taken back his soul. <laughs> and now you see why the flying Dutchman is seed upon the seas no more. Well, that's the end of that dumb Satan. <laughs> Anywhere and anything can be haunted, and many people from all walks of life experience strange things in surprising locations. As you will discover, the prettiest of places, the most innocent of places, and the most unexpected places can still be filled with supernatural forces and pure demonic malevolence. Haunted places, churches, hospitals, forests, the workplace, and more. Horrifying true tales of ghosts, demons, poltergeists, and the paranormal. Come and be chilled by people's creepy experiences with the supernatural in ordinary, everyday places. Warning: Listening to this audiobook may increase nervousness. True Tales of Haunted Places by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Countdown for blast off. X minus five. Minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents. X, 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 X minus, 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 one. Tonight, X minus one presents Perigi's Wonderful Dolls by George Lefferts. The 
doll shop stood on a quiet Washington side street, not too far from the sprawling Pentagon building. A woman and child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window at the dolls inside. And the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. There was nothing about the doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom. Mommy, look! Hmm? What, dear? In the window of the shop, the tiny dolls. Oh, Mommy, do you think Daddy will buy me one? We'll ask him when he comes, dear. Should be here soon. He said three o'clock on this corner. I see him, Mommy. See? Oh, Henry! Over here. Hello, dear. I'm sorry I'm late. Well, we're all ready to go shopping. Cindy's been... Yes, well, re- I'm afraid we'll have to call off the shopping, Elmer. Oh, Henry, we promised Cindy. Well, I'm sorry, but it's just one of those things. You've been the wife of an army colonel long enough to know his life isn't his own. What is it this time? Well, some more of that flying sphere nonsense. The pilot who says he sighted it last month crashed and was killed today, and the general wants a full report. Oh, dear. What next? Well, I got a staff meeting at the Pentagon at 3.15. Daddy, look in this window. Yes, well, I haven't time, dear. Alma, I... Yes. Just for a minute, Daddy, yes. please. Now, Cindy, I haven't time to stop and watch a bunch of six-inch dolls parading around in a shop window. Say, <laughs> hey, they are lifelike, aren't they? Look at that, Alma. Dolls are marching around like a regular review. They've even got their own little band. <laughs> See the one in the red jacket, Daddy? Yeah. He's the leader. He's bowing to us. Well, uh, if they don't look human... Henry, your staff meeting. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. Well, I got to run. Can we buy one, Daddy? Well, not now, dear, and I'll run along. Now, don't go spending a lot of money on that nonsense. No, now. dear. Bye. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Bye, Daddy. Oh, look, Mommy, the band is going to play. Aren't they wonderful, honey? Honey, I must have stood on this corner a thousand times. I've never noticed this shop before. Look at the man inside, Mommy. Who's he? That's the proprietor, dear. Doesn't he look funny with those those red cheeks and white mustache? It's easy to see who he models his dolls after. I mean, look, he's coming to the door. He's coming. Good evening, children. Uh, uh, good evening. How funny he talks. Hush, Cindy. Uh, would you like to step inside the shop of Santo Pirigi? Well, yes, we would. But... Uh, this way. Mommy, it's like, like fairyland. Here in the shop of Santo Pirigi, creator of Pirigi's universal, wonderful dolls, the world of adult reality is blended with the world of child's fantasy. This is a new shop, isn't it, Mr. Pirigi? What is new and what is old? Come, this way. Would you like to meet one of my little ones? Oh, yes. Now, this one in the red jacket is Toto. He's the leader. <laughs> Handle him ever so gently. See, I will set him on the table. Speak, little one. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Oh, oh my, he talks, the doll talks. Oh, amazing, absolutely amazing. That is nothing for Pirigi's wonderful dolls. Listen, sing. Sing, Toto. Sing for the little girl. My name is Toto. <laughs> oh, my. Sing, Toto. Men are big and tall. Dolls are very small. When men begin to fall, the dolls will rule them all. <laughs> oh, more, more. Uh, how do they work, Mr. Parigi? How do they work? Ah, that is the secret of the great Pirigi, greatest of all doll makers. To make an ordinary doll is nothing. To make a perfect replica, that is something. But to make a doll with intelligence, that is the work of an artist, eh? I suppose that they're very expensive to buy. But Pirigi does not sell his dolls, madam. You don't sell them? When I construct a doll like Toto, I cannot bear to be permanently separated from him. So instead of selling, I rent my little people. You do? You rent dolls? Precisely. Ten dollars. For how long? For as long as they are cherished. My only request is that when you grow tired of my dolls, you return them to me in good condition. Oh, 
Mommy, could we take him home? Take him home. Take him home. Take him home. <laughs> oh, look, he's bowing and dancing. He wants to well, come. Honey, your father said that we shouldn't spend a lot oh, of money. Oh, please, I'll take such good care of it. Please. Well, honey, we'll have to deal with your father later, but... Well... Oh, Mommy. All right. Wrap him up, Mr. Parigi. But I have a feeling that when your father comes home, we'll be sorry. Be sorry. Be sorry. Be sorry. Be sorry. <laughs> Toto, this is my room, and you're going to sleep right here next to my pillow. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't laugh like that. I'm going to have to teach you some manners. <laughs> and you'll be quiet because my daddy will be home soon. And he's a colonel in the Air Force staff, and he'll bust you to private if you don't behave. Come along now, I'm going to introduce you to my puppy dog, Mr. Blister, so be good. Here, Mr. Blister. Here, Blister. Come on. <laughs> Mr. Blister, this is Toto. Oh, dear, I don't think Mr. Blister likes you, Toto. Come over here and shake hands with Toto, Mr. Blister. Come on now. Honey, dolls don't get frightened. But he was frightened, Mommy. He screamed. You imagined it, dear. It's only a doll. He did. He did. Well, Mr. Blister didn't mean it. Now, you know he's the gentlest little pup alive. He is, and he's nasty, and I hate him. Oh, <laughs> now, see, you've hurt his feelings. I don't care. He tried to bite my new doll, and I don't ever want to see him again, ever. Oh, dear. All right, Mr. Blister, you come downstairs with me. Cindy's angry with you tonight. I'll kill him. Cindy, where did you learn a thing like that? I... Toto said it. Honey, you've had a, a very exciting day. Now, brush your teeth now and go to bed, hmm? Daddy's coming home late, so he'll see you in the morning. Good night, dear. Sleep well. I hate him. <laughs> hate him. Hate him. Hate him! Hate him! <laughs> Morning, Alma. Breakfast ready? In a minute, dear. Mm. How was the staff meeting last oh, night? Horrible bore, as usual. I don't know what's got into the old man. Just because a few farmers corroborated the pilot's report, he thinks some strange aircraft has penetrated our radar zone. <laughs> well, where's the little one? Up in her room. Well, now, that's funny. She's usually down here before me. Well, she's probably up to something. Sit down, dear. Say, remind me to take some papers back to the War Department, will you? I left them in my strong box. You haven't been bringing your reports home, have you? Well, it's safe enough. Well, you told me it was against regulations to bring secret papers home. Well, I had to finish some work for the old man, and nobody will ever know the difference. Well, I don't know. Oh, would you feed the puppy before we sit down, Henry? Mm, yes. His bowl's under the sink. Where is he? Say, that's funny, is Here's his supper from last night, only half eaten. He's getting fussy. Doesn't like canned dog food anymore. Oh. Here, Blister. Here, Blister, Blister, Blister. I wonder where the dickens is that mutt. Maybe he's on the back porch. Here, Blister. Hey. Alma. What is it, dear? Alma, look. <gasps> Henry, is he... He's dead. But how? But what he looks of it, he, he might have been poisoned. But who would do a thing like that to an innocent little puppy? I don't know. Let me see his dish. Look at that. I don't understand this at all. Not at all. What, dear? What is it? There are pieces of broken glass in this food. Blue glass, you see? How? Henry. What? I just remembered something. What? It may be coincidence, but... In the bathroom this morning. Well, what about the bathroom? Oh, Cindy's blue glass, the one with the Mickey Mouse on it, was broken. I found pieces in the wastebasket. I meant to ask her about oh, it. Alma, for heaven's sake, you aren't suggesting that our little girl... Well, she loved Blister more than anyone. Not last night, she didn't. Why not? He went after Toto. Now, who is Toto? That's her new doll. Her what? Honey, I was meaning to tell you. But you, you bought her one of those dolls. I, huh? I just rented it. Well, 
rented it. Now, look here, Alma, you know we haven't got the kind of money to throw away Well, she had her heart set on it, dear. I used my dividend. (sighs) All right. But what happened with Blister? Well, he went for the doll, and and Cindy said she hated him. Oh, well, a child She said she'd kill him. Where'd she get a thought like that? I don't know. Has she been watching those chillers on television? I don't know. Well, it's too ridiculous. Good heavens, a nine-year-old child putting ground glass in dog food, she'd have to be a monster. Mommy! She's coming. Mm, Well, don't say anything. I'll talk to her. Morning, dear. Morning, Mommy. Morning, Daddy. What's the matter? Uh, Sit down, dear. Yes, sir. Now, your mother tells me you broke your blue drinking glass. Oh, no, I didn't break it. Cindy. I didn't. Well, now, somebody broke it. It wasn't your mother, and it wasn't me. And it must have been Toto. Cynthia! Cindy, you know Toto is only a doll. Now, a doll couldn't have broken your glass, could he? Well? I guess not. So we can't very well blame it on a doll, then, can we? But he must have done it, Daddy. Cindy, you know how Daddy feels about little girls who tell fibs. Now, did you break your glass and maybe accidentally get some pieces into Mr. Blister's dish to sort of punish him for biting your doll? Daddy. Well, I'd hate to think you'd done something you knew was wrong and you were blaming it on a doll. Is something wrong with Mr. Blister? Is he sick? Worse than that. Henry. And the child has to face reality, Alma. What's the matter with Mr. Blister? He's dead, Cindy. Oh, no. He can't be dead. He isn't dead, Daddy. No, he isn't. He isn't. Mommy. Honey, he is dead, Cindy. He'll come back. He has to come back. No, darling, he won't come back. Ever? Not ever. Yes. Uh, now that we've told you, Cindy, you want to change your mind about the glass? And we leave her alone, please. <laughs> you think I killed him? Now look what you've done. The child feels guilty <laughs> enough, My, my Henry. dear, this is no time for feelings to interfere. You go up to the room, honey. Daddy and I'll be up in a minute. I don't want to. Please, Cindy. Now, we'll be right up, please. There. That's a good girl. Close the kitchen door behind you. Mr. Blister's dead. He isn't coming back. Ever. Ever. Daddy thinks it was me, but... It was you. It was you. your supper, dear. I'm not hungry. You scarcely touched your lunch. I don't feel like eating. Is it Mr. Blister? (laughs) Now answer your mother. She'll work it out her own way, Henry. I don't know, Elma. When I was a boy, there was such a thing as discipline. Now, the way this child is being brought up... Henry! Well, it's true. There's no respect, lying and... (laughs) Oh, there, there, honey. Now, your father's upset. He doesn't mean it. what's happened to us? We were a nice, peaceful, happy family until you bought that cursed doll. Now who's blaming things on the doll? Well, it's true. Oh, now I've spilled my coffee. I'll get you another cup. Never mind. I'm late now. I better be going. Oh, you uh, wanted to get some papers from the strong box. Oh, yes. Cindy, please, try to eat something. Yes, ma'am. Alma! Alma! What is it? Alma! It's gone! What's gone? The box, the strong box is gone! It can't be! The door to your study's always locked. You and I, I have the only keys. Yeah, I know all that, and I tell you it isn't there. Well, who would go? I don't know. Alma, those confidential reports, if they ever got into the wrong place. I house... warned you about keeping them well, there. What if it ever came out in the open? Can't you see the papers? Call the police, yeah. Henry. And throw my army career in a wastebasket after 17 years? No. We've got to find it ourselves. Well, it was there when I went in to clean this morning. What about your key? It's right here. I always keep it with me. It's funny. Oh, no. My other keys are on the ring. Oh, you've lost it. I don't see how. Alma, Alma, how could you do Oh, Henry, please. We'll search the house. I can't think of anything else to do. Well, you'll miss the staff meeting. Meeting? My whole career goes up in smoke if we don't find those reports. Somebody got hold of your key and opened that room and... I know. Cindy. You leave the child alone. She's been through enough. You know she wouldn't do a thing like that. I don't know anything anymore. I don't even know my own child. I don't even know you. 
All I know is that strong box is gone and it contains papers that are dynamite if the wrong person gets them. The question being who? What's that? It's coming from upstairs. It must be Cindy's doll. Oh, that blasted doll again. <laughs> Something must have set it off. I don't know how to, the, the mechanism now, works. For heaven's sakes, let's go up and shut it off. Since you Henry, what? Look, where? What? Around the doll's neck, the key, the key to your study. You see, Alma, it was Cindy after all. I don't believe well, it. Well, good heavens, do you have to have it spelled out for you? Here's our doll with a key around its she neck. She wouldn't, Henry. You know she wouldn't. Oh, ever since you got this uh, this fool doll, she's been acting half insane. At first the dog, and now this. I think she hates us. Henry, Alma. Cindy is my child. I know her. I know she's a good, sensitive person with no malice in uh, you're her. You're simply refusing to face the facts, my dear. What are you going to do? I'm going downstairs and have a talk with that young lady. You're not telling the truth, Cindy. I am. I am. Cindy, now you know that strong box is very important to me. Now, I can understand that you might have been angry at me because I scolded you. And so you took it and hid it, just to spite me. Now, all I ask is for you to tell me the truth. Now, where is it? I didn't take it, Daddy. Honest, I didn't take it. <sighs> well, I suppose you're going to tell me now that a little six-inch doll took it and hid it. Well... I'm speaking to you, young lady. But I didn't take it, Daddy. You don't understand. Toto did it. He's terrible, awful. He says things. He's going to kill everybody. Cindy, you're inventing things. It's true. At night when I'm sleeping, he stands next to my pillow and whispers things to me. Awful things. He told me he'd kill me, too, if I scold Alma, if I told you. I think this child is sick. I think she needs a doctor. She's frightened, Henry. He's trembling like a leaf. Come on, dear. We'll go up to your room. I don't want to go up there. Honey, Mommy will stay with you. I'm afraid he's up there. Who? Toto! Well, he won't be up there for long. Mr. Toto is going right back to Pierigi's wonderful doll shop before I lose my sanity, which means right now. And welcome to the home of Pirigi's wonderful doll. Are you Pirigi? Santor Pirigi, creator of the universal doll, the doll with the mind, the doll which... I'm returning one of your masterpieces. Oh? If you will step into the rear of my shop. Now the complaint. No complaint. Here's your doll. Good riddance. My little Toto. Rejected. You found the world of men too filled with hate. Hate, 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 hate! We will change all that later on. Return to your comrades in the window, little one. And now, Colonel Grayson. I think we have no further business. Ah, here. but we do, Colonel. Let me see. Ah, yes, here it is. Do you recognize this strong box, Colonel? My strong box? Well, where? My little Toto is very clever, sir. Are you trying to tell me your doll stole that from me? Let us not say stole. I am merely keeping it in custody. What's the game, Pierigi? The game, as you call it, is blackmail. You give me what I want, and I do not ruin your career. Well, what do you want? Information. We already know something from the reports of the War Department concerning a certain strange-looking sphere reported by one of your pilots. What government do you represent? I represent Pierigi's wonderful dolls, none other. <laughs> I am not so naive, sir. Perhaps I should explain. Each man hides something from the world. Each man loves something more than life. With the help of my wonderful dolls, I obtain personal information which enables me to control the men who control the world. You're a madman. A genius. You would be surprised at the list of men who have become the confidants for my dolls. 
Do you think you can blackmail me into betraying my country? If the price is right. And in this case, sir, the price is your career and the lives of your wife and child. Why are you so interested in the flying spirit? Well, let us say for reasons of my own. Well, Colonel? Hand over the strong box. And I warn you, I have a gun. Give it to me. You are being foolish. Put down that walking stick. Now? No closer. Now? Hello? Give me the police. Hello? Yes, this is Colonel Henry Grayson. I've, uh, I've just killed a man. Yes, Perigi's doll shop, corner of 4th and Lexington. The body is in the back room. Yes, I'll wait for you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up, you little fiend. Colonel Grayson. Did, did I hear it speak? Colonel Henry Grayson. <laughs> I must be going out of my mind, a six-inch doll. <laughs> Shut up, your master's dead. You are mistaken, Colonel. I, Toto, am the master. What do you mean? If you will examine the body of Santor Perigi, you will see that he does not bleed. And he does not bleed, Colonel, because Santor Perigi never lived. Never lived? Santor Perigi is a doll. A doll? But that's impossible. He's a man. He talks. He walks. The people of Meritrix are skillful doll builders. People of Meritrix? Doll but Look, who are you? I am Xanthus Imperator, commander of the legions of the third planetoid, Meritrix. Uh, legions? Planetoid? I... My people and I, whom you regard as dolls come from a tiny planet beyond the moon, so small that it cannot support our population. We landed one of our space spheres on Earth three months ago with the intention of colonizing. Unfortunately, one of your pilots intercepted us. So that's why you wanted our information. Precisely. Are you, uh, are you, uh, human? Oh, quite human. Uh, of course, in order to deal with Earth people without suspicion, we were forced to construct Perigi, a man-sized doll. Oh, well, I can't believe this. I'm having hallucinations. I'm going to get out of here. Oh, that would be impossible. We have weapons of destruction quite unknown to Earth people. Well, I phoned the police and they'll be here soon. By the time they arrive, my people will have prepared something quite shocking. <laughs> Cover him, Ryan. Okay, Sergeant. You the guy who turned in the call? Yes. Where's the body? Well, it isn't exactly a body. What do you mean? It's a doll. A what? Well, you've got to let me explain. Now, this sounds fantastic, but I've stumbled onto an unbelievable plot to control the world. Keep talking. Now, these little dolls, they aren't really dolls. They're tiny people. There's a big doll named Santo Perigi, and he runs this shop. Holy smokes. He's off his trolley, sir. Listen, mister, we got a call that there was a murder here. Now, if there was one, where's the body? Behind those curtains in the back. Only, it isn't really a body, you see. Why? I hear something back there, Sarge. All right, cover those curtains. Yo! Is anyone back there? Come on out. Come out or we'll come in and get you. Something's coming. The curtain's opening. Welcome, gentlemen. Perigi. Well, this is impossible. I smashed his skull. I. You know this guy? Yes, that, that's the one. That's the doll. What's your name, mister? Perigi. Santo Perigi, creator of the Universal Doll. You ever see this man? Never until just now. What? Well, he's lying. I tell you, he's nothing but a life-sized doll. The real masters are these little dolls. Ryan, are you getting this? He's wacko, Sarge. Nutty as a fruit. Look, look, I'm not crazy, I tell you. I can prove it. They, they must have fixed up his head when I when I smashed it in. T Touch him, you'll see. Mr. Perigi, 
You know what the guy is talking about. The man is demented, obviously. Look, look, I tell you, there's a there's a plot to control the Earth. Listen, you, you've got to let me call the War Department. They'll want to know about the flying sphere. Holy mackerel, this gets worse every minute. Ryan. Take him to headquarters? Save some time. Take him down to the psycho ward. Okay, Buck Rogers. Uh, look, I'm along nice look, look, and quiet look, you've got to listen to me. Don't you see the future of mankind is at stake? Sure, sure. I know how it is. Look, he's nothing but a man-sized doll. Touch him. And the little ones are going to take over the Earth. I know. I had the DTs once. Okay, Sarge. Oh, we'll see you later. Please, please. Come along. Please, now. listen to me. You've got to listen to me. Sorry to cause all this trouble, Mr. Parisi. Not at all, sir. Not at all. <laughs> well, I'll be. Well, nah, that ain't the cutest little doll. Say, my little girl will be nuts for that. But perhaps you will accept it as a gift. Well, now. Nah, for saving I... my life. That madman might have killed me. No home is really complete without one of Pirici's wonderful dolls, Sergeant. Is that right, Toto? <laughs> yes, but I... I, I, I would like in some way to show my gratitude. You will be doing me a favor if you will take the doll home to your little daughter. <laughs> Say, this ought to make her the happiest girl in the world. Yes, Toto will come <laughs> as a great surprise. A very great surprise. Won't it, Toto? <laughs> Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Perigi's Wonderful Dolls, written by George Lefferts. Heard in the cast were Janet Alexander as Cindy, Anne Petoniak as Alma, Nelson Olmsted as Henry, Joe DeSantis as Perigi, Michael O'Day as Toto, Ken Lynch as the Sergeant, and Frank Milano as Ryan. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Tonight's story concludes the present series of stories of the world of the future. If you'd like to hear X-1 return to the air at some later date, please drop us a postcard or letter addressed to X-1, care of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, New York. Road dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, get your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay.
The Avenger's sworn enemy of evil is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the Coins of Death. Thank you. You come to Yanina, the queen of the gypsies, to have your future foretold. Is that not so? Yes. My name is Casper Hobson. A friend of mine recommended you. Sit there, across the table, in the lamplight. I would see your face. Oh, yes, of course. Now, cross this old gypsy's palm with silver, and she will call upon the spirits of all Romany to reveal your future to Yanina. Silver, yes, I... I have a coin for you here. A, a rare old silver coin. Here, take it. No! No! I curse upon you! Got you! What is it? What's the matter? Oh, this silver is accursed. You are doomed. What are you talking about? A curse upon you! Got you! Go away! Go away! You have no future. Listen here, I have a right to know what you're raving you about. Go away! Got you! Get out! Baldo! Baldo! Come quick! Drive this cursed one from the gypsy town. All right, I'll go. But this sort of thing is outrageous. It should be reported to the police. Oh, God, you go. The mark of death is upon you. You have no future. Out of my sight, God, you go. Go, You have no future. <laughs> Climb in the car, quick, Casper. You're dripping wet. Yes, thanks, Tom. Let's get out of here. Casper, you're shaking like a leaf. What's the matter? Start driving, I'll tell you. Now, what is it? Well, that old hag of a gypsy woman. She drove me out. You mean she wouldn't tell your fortune? That's right, Tom. She shrieked at me like a mad woman. <laughs> Told me I had no future. Oh, that's nothing to get so upset about, Casper. Probably her stock way of getting rid of customers after she gets her money. Yeah, that's what I would have thought, too. Except she didn't take my money. She didn't take your money? No, she threw it away from her as though it had a plague on it. Then she started shouting that I had no future. Oh, don't take it so seriously, Casper. All this fortune telling is a bunk anyway. I'm surprised you ever bothered driving out here over this muddy country road in this weather. Our well, business worries can drive a man to any extreme, Tom, and I am worried. Now, look, Casper, you're on the very threshold of a million dollars. Well, that C3M you've invented will revolutionize the whole industry. That's just the trouble. It'll drive hundreds of established companies out of business and make a legion of enemies for me. Be, be careful, Tom. Tom, you almost went off the road there. The cliff dropped sheer all along here. Yeah, it's raining so hard I can hardly see. This muddy road's as slippery as glass. Well, take it easy. My nerves are bad enough as it is. Ah, good dinner will fix you up, Casper. We're coming to the summit of the hill now. It won't be so bad from there on in. Yeah. Gee, look at that rain. Yeah. Hey, Tom, we've got a flat. Steady the car. I can't. We're skidding. The brakes won't hold. We're going over the cliff. Jump, Tom, Jump! <laughs> I picked up that white music on the telepathic indicator again. Where do you suppose it's coming from, Jim? I'm not sure, Fern, but it sounds like gypsy music. Could be coming from that gypsy camp several miles out of town. Fern, quick, turn up the volume a little. Yes, Jim. What happened, Jim? Suddenly, right in the midst of the music, there was a crashing sound, and then complete silence. Well, maybe the storm cut off the reception. Well, that's not very likely, Fern. Telepathic messages aren't usually affected by elemental disturbances. When the indicator suddenly loses contact with a strong impression like that, it usually means that the thought itself has been terminated by violence. Oh, stay with it, Jim. Looks like this may be something important.
Were you able to pick up anything more, Jim? No, not a thing, Fern. Oh. Oh, that must be Inspector White, Jim. Remember, we invited him to dinner. Oh, yes. Uh, now turn off the indicator, Fern. Yeah. I'll let the inspector in. Right, Jim. Oh, just when I finish up all the reports on one case, something else turns up. Good evening, Fern. Oh, hello, Inspector. He'll be ready to go as soon as I file his reports. Is it still raining? Well, it's beginning to let up a little now. Some storm, though. Anything new at headquarters, Inspector? Not a thing, Jim. Had a nice, quiet, routine day for a change. Now, I'll get it, Fern. Hello? Oh, yes. Yes, the inspector just came in. Just a minute, please. It's for you, inspector. Oh, what's up now? Hello, Inspector White speaking. What? Holy smoke, it would have to happen way out there. Okay, yeah, I'll go right away. What's the trouble, inspector? A car went over the cliff out near Marsden. An accident. But I've got to get out there and make a report. Well, we'll go with you, Inspector. We can have dinner when we get back. Yes, uh, this may be the very thing I picked up on the indicator a while ago. Now, listen, Jim. You can come along if you want to. But don't try any of your hunches. This is an accident. This is the road we took to the scene of the accident last night? That's right, Fern. Well, oh, why are we coming out here again? Jim, you're holding back on me. What are you up to? Well, I did a little checking when I got home last night, Fern, and discovered that this Hobson accident was the second to occur at that same spot within a few months. Oh, in other words, you're suspicious? Yes. But this is a very dangerous piece of road, Jim, and in wet weather, I can easily see how a car might skid over the side. Yes, but what was that car doing out here last night? This is really a private road. And no one in his right mind would drive over it in a storm if there were any other way of reaching his destination. Well, this is all farmland around here. Here's the spot where the car went over the cliff. Uh, I want to take a look around. Come on, Fern. What are you looking for, Jim? Well, the tires on that car were badly ripped. I wonder if that happened before the car went over or when it crashed. Well, let's see if we can find anything. The rain seems to have done a good job of covering up all traces of the skidding. Mm, the mud's too deep to do much walking around here. Yeah, they might as well drive on, Fern. There's not a trace of a clue here. Look, Jim, there's a fork in the road just ahead. Yeah, and there's a mailbox there, too. I, I want to see the name on it. Oh, I think you're making a mountain out of a molehill, Jim. This is just an old country road. Can you make out the name on the box? Yeah, it's, uh... Philip Peters. Now what? Do we drive up that road and call on Farmer Philip Peters? No, no, we don't. First, we'll investigate the other fork in the road. Well, nothing as invigorating as a morning drive in the country, I always say. Only when I think of all the work I have to do on those laboratory reports, I can't enjoy it as I should. Look, Fern, over there. Oh, it's a gypsy camp. I thought they were located somewhere in this section. Now this motor trip is beginning to make a little sense. Listen... Can you hear music? Oh, yes. It's nice, isn't it? Nice. Fern, that's the same music I picked up on the telepathic indicator just before the crash last night. Oh, gosh, Jim. Do you suppose all this adds up to something? I think so, Fern. Come on. Jim, do you think it's a good idea to go barging in on these gypsies? Well, we'll soon find out. Oh, look, Jim. Yeah? There's an old gypsy woman standing in front of that first tent. She's giving us a dirty look. Let's see if she'll give us any information. Stop, Baldo! Stop music! Stop music, I say! Make circle, gypsies! Make wrong circle! Oh, Jim, I don't like this. Those gypsies look menacing. What do strangers want from gypsies? A little information. Oh. Or oh, you want fortune told. Or cross all Yanina's palm with silver, and she will call upon the spirits of all Romany. Uh, no, no, you don't understand. It's uh, not about myself I wish to ask. Uh, what then? What you want? I'm making inquiries about the accident that occurred near here last night. Gypsies don't know, don't know anything. Did two men come here last night about 7 o'clock? You're from police? Yes, I'm connected with the police. So you better tell me what you know. Men are shung in Malay. Men are shung in Malay. What's he saying, Jim? I don't know. Answer in English. What did you say? Gypsies know nothing. Go away. Let gypsies alone. Not until you answer my question. Were there two men here last night? Yes. One man come, the other wait in car. What did the man want? He want Gypsy to tell him future. Yes, and what did you tell him? What can I tell him? He is cursed. He has no future. How did you know that? You didn't read that in his palm. I will say nothing more. Then I think you better come with us. 
Maybe the police can make your talk down at headquarters. No, no. I'm a new young man. I'm a new young man. Speak in English. The accursed must die. You cannot blame gypsies. Maybe not, but you know more than you're telling. Oh, Jim, I think we'd better get out of go here. Go away, Gajo, go away. Things will go better with you if you'll come along with us quietly. No, no, I will not go. You, Gajo, always try to make trouble for gypsies. Oh, Jim, come on. Those men have clubs and they're closing in on us. Go away, go away, Gajo. Bardo, Bardo, me come Gajo. Come Gajo. Come Gajo. Back to the Avenger and the Coins of Death. Jim, this case is beginning to look sinister. Don't you worry your pretty head, Fern. Things are beginning to shape up fairly well now. Jim, just how much stock do you put in the weird story that old gypsy woman told them down at headquarters? Well, that's hard to say, Fern. Yanina was wild with anger because we sent Inspector White's men out there to bring her in. She might have told a few lies just to get even. That's why I'm going to investigate everything she said. She claimed that Philip Peters, who owned the land where the gypsy camp is located, gave them permission to stay there as long as they wished it, didn't she? Yes, and uh, now that either means that Mr. Peters is a very generous man or that he had some reason for wanting the gypsies to stay there. Oh, I don't trust those gypsies, Jim. All the facts in the case seem to hinge around them. Yes. Yanina admits that Richfield, the first victim, came to her camp the night he went over the cliff three months ago. She told him he had no future. And no one ever saw him alive again. Then she told Hobson the same thing. And he went over the cliff. Well, we can be sure she's holding something back, Jim. She absolutely refused to reveal why she told those two men they had no future. Yes, she conveniently claims that the spirits of her tribe would curse her if she reveals her reason for predicting their deaths. Oh, a neat method of holding back vital information, I'd say. Well, we'll soon find out. Right now, I'm off to have a talk with Philip Peters. Do I come too, Jim? No, Fern. I'm going out to the Peters farm as the Avenger. <laughs> What's that? Who's in this barn? It's the Avenger, Peters. The Avenger? Where are you? I can't see you. No, but you can hear me, Peters. Well, what do you want? I I haven't done anything. I thought the Avenger only fought criminals. I haven't committed any crime. Are you quite sure of that, Peters? There's evidence against you. Well, you can't frighten me, Avenger. I'm an honest farmer, and my conscience is clear. Then you shouldn't mind answering some questions. If they'll help solve a murder. Well, what are you getting at? Just this. Why did you give that tribe of gypsies permission to live rent-free on your land? Well, I didn't. uh, Well, I mean, that is, I... What do you mean, Peters? If 
you didn't want them to stay, you could have driven them off. This is your land, isn't it? Yes, that is, in, in a way. Start I... making sense, Peters. Or I'm not going to believe you're as innocent as you claim to be. Well, uh, all right. I, I was warned never to tell this. But I didn't count on getting mixed up in anything crooked. Do you own the land or don't you? Oh, no, no, I, I don't own it. Uh, the property's in my name and I run this farm. But uh, somebody else really owns the place. Who owns it, Peters? Well, Dr. Milet, who lives at Seven Willows. He's the owner. But he doesn't want anybody to know it. He said I could live here rent-free as long as I pretended the place was mine. Was it Dr. Milet's idea to let the gypsies stay here? Yes, uh, that was part of the bargain. I was to let the gypsies camp here until he told me to drive them off. They've been here for almost a year now. I don't think they'll want to stay much longer, Peters. Well, I, I'll be out on my ear now, too. Say nothing of this, and you will be protected. You evaded justice, Peters. But remember, you must say nothing of this encounter with the Avenger. <laughs> Seven Willows just ahead. I think this must be the lane Jim meant for me to meet him. Oh, I thought he'd be here waiting. I hope nothing's happened. Oh, there he is. Jim, over here. Uh, hello, Fern. You're from Wolf to the minute. Oh, get in the car, Jim, and tell me what's been happening. What in the world were you doing up at Seven Willows? I thought you were going to see Peters. I went to Peters first and then came here to line on Dr. Milet. Dr. Milet? Who's he? He's a mind analyst who specializes in silent thought as a nerve treatment for wealthy clients. Well, how does he fit into the picture? Did you question him? No, I went into Seven Willows merely to observe and listen. No one saw me. Did you find out anything, Jim? Plenty, I think. Dr. Milet was interviewing a young lady by the name of Helen Dresden. When she asked him for advice about her future, he suggested that she visit the gypsies. Ah, oh, this is beginning to add up to something at last. Yeah, we'll have to work fast, Burns starting to rain. Well, what do we do, Jim? First, we'll intercept Miss Dresden as she drives past here. I'll block the road with our car and she'll have to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, there. we better get out of the car, Fern. All right. Oh, here she comes now. What's the matter? Is your car stalled? Uh, no, we want to speak to you for a moment. What is this? Listen, if you... Oh, please don't be frightened, Miss Dresden. This is Jim Brandon of the police department. Oh, well, what do you want? Miss Dresden, I have reason to believe your life is in danger. Oh, well, that's a perfectly silly idea. Oh, no, it isn't, Miss Dresden. Several deaths have already occurred, and Mr. Brandon thinks you are the next online. You're headed for the gypsy camp, aren't you, Miss Dresden? That's right. If you wish to save your life, you'll let Miss Collier go in your place. But, but why? You will have to trust us, Miss Dresden. Well, well, what do you want me to do? You take my car and go directly to police headquarters. We'll borrow your car and go to the gypsy camp. Hmm. All right. I don't get this, but if you're from the police, I suppose you know what you're doing. Oh, and uh, one other thing, Miss Dresden. What instructions did Dr. Milet give you? Why, uh, well, none in particular. Uh, he told me the gypsy woman, Janina, was clever at foretelling the future. Yeah. To go over there and, um... Oh, yes, he told me to give her this old silver coin. Let me see that coin. Here. Look at this, Fern. What is it, Jimmy? Oh, I've never seen a silver piece like that. No, Fern. This is Dr. Milet's coin of death. Ah, uh, that's Yanina's tent, Fern. I'll wait here while you go inside. You know what to do. Yes, Jim. This should only take a minute. Madame Yanina? Madame Yanina, may I come inside? Yes. Come. Oh, it's you. What you want now? Come make more trouble for gypsies. No, Madame Yanina. I want to have my future read. Now you make joke of gypsy. No, seriously. I want you to tell my fortune. Oh, sit down, then. Across the gypsy's palm with silver. Yes. Here is a coin. No. No. Oh, what's the matter? You are cursed. You have no future. Go away. Got you. Go away. Oh, Madame Yanina. Oh, go. Go, you have no future. You have no future. Out of my sight, Gajo. You will die. You will die. 
Are you sure you understand exactly what to do? Yes, Jim. When we come to that big pine tree, just before we reach the place where those other cars went over the cliff, I'm to jump out of the car. I'll stay with the car a moment longer and then follow you. Oh, be sure to jump in time, Jim. Otherwise... When you, you jump out, keep well off the road so no one can see you. I understand. Open the car door, Fern. Get ready. We're coming to the place. Okay, Fern. Jump. Oh. Well... I don't seem to have any broken bones. Oh, I hope Jim makes it all right. Gosh, I'm covered with mud. Fern, Fern, where are you? Here, Jim. You all right? Oh, fine. Ah, there goes the car over the cliff, Fern. Come on. Oh, look, Jim. There's a man on the road up ahead. Yes, he's pulling in a big board from the road. It's time for action, Fern. Oh, do be careful, Jim. All right, Dr. Mallard. I've got you covered. Stand where you are. Who's that? It's the police. Your little scheme didn't work this time, Doctor. The police? You won't take me alive! Jim, he's running toward the cliff. He's not going to get away as easy as that. I'll head him off. Oh, be careful, Jim. This room is slippery. No, you don't, Dr. Myler. Let me go. You're one of the murder, Myler. And you're going to get what's coming to you. Oh, Jim. He's fighting for you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Jim, are you all right? Yes, Fern. I had to knock Myler out. Oh, Jim, for a moment I thought... Come on, Fern. Let's get our prisoner back to town. You're drenched. <laughs> Just a few points I want to get clear before I speak to the reporters. Reporters, Inspector? So soon? Well, this is something hot, Jim. Until I got my last confession, those deaths were booked as accidents. Really? You should be more careful, Inspector. Now, Jim, don't start that. Okay, okay, Inspector. What do you want to know? Well, Mylot confessed that he was paid by a big businessman to get rid of Ridgefield and Hobson because both of them were about to patent a new process that would have ruined their competitors. But he won't say a word about that Dresden girl. Why did he plan to get rid of her? Yes, Jim. I don't understand that either. Helen Dresden was to inherit a fortune on her 25th birthday, which falls next week. Now, Miss Dresden didn't know this, but one of her cousins did and paid Dr. Mila to get rid of Helen so the fortune would be divided among the remaining relatives. But, Jim, all this doesn't explain what part the gypsies played in the affair. The gypsies were the mysterious angle in the case, Fern. Actually, though, they had nothing to do with the murders. They didn't? No. Dr. Milet had the gypsies on that land in order to have an excuse to send his victims out on that deserted road. And while his victim visited the gypsy, Milet laid his trap. You see, he placed a big plank with long spikes in it across the road, just at the summit of the cliff. And he covered the whole thing with mud so it couldn't be seen. Now, the road was very narrow at the summit, and when the tires blew out, the car skidded enough to send it right over the cliff. And they always chose rainy weather for the job so that the car would be certain to skid. 
And to make it look more like an accident. But those coins, what about them, Jim? The coins were just a precaution to cast suspicion on the gypsies in case the victim might survive the accident. But why did the old gypsy go wild at the very sight of those coins and tell everyone who offered them to her that he had no future? Because, Fern, those coins were exact copies of the silver Judas accepted for the betrayal. All gypsies have been taught to hate them and to believe that all who possess them are doomed. Well, I think I owe Yanina an apology. Her predictions proved true in this case, anyway. Those really were coins of death. Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought, a thought, a thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of The Avenger. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Basil Rathbone inviting you to join me beyond the green door. Today we shall follow Henry Dill on the road to adventure, a road which sometimes leads beyond the green door. In August of 1927, Henry Dill set out on a world cruise. He was a romantic young man and he hoped to find adventure in the mysterious ports of the world. But the adventures never came. Tangier was dull, Algiers was stuffy, and Malaga was a fraud. Dill found this very disappointing, and when his ship docked in Oran, he went ashore and got thoroughly drunk. He awoke in a strange hotel room with a monumental hangover. When he lifted his head, he saw a French officer sitting beside him. Well, what's the matter? Dill asked. Did I do something wrong? Wrong, the officer said. No, you did nothing wrong, my friend. Uh, do you, don't you remember me? We, uh, we drank together last night. Oh, yeah, of course, Dill said. No, he could remember hardly anything. Ah, what a night that was, the French officer said. We sang many songs and we pledged our friendship in a dozen bottles of wine, huh? <laughs> we talked and you told me of your great longing for adventure. You must have sounded very silly, <laughs> Dill said. Not at all, my friend. The officer assured him. A man needs danger and risk. In the past, you have only seen the dull, civilized places. But all that is changed now. For now, my friend, I personally will send you to adventure. Oh, that's great, Dill said cautiously. Huh? Well, what, what, what sort of adventure? You will leave Oran, the officer said, and go to Sidi Belabes, uh, where the true Sahara begins. Then you will proceed southward into the desert. Your way leads across mountains of black rock, razor-edged and hot as lava. 
one of a thousand uh, Torag warriors may lie in ambush as you descend once more to the waterless desert. Finally, with luck, you will reach your destination at Fort Charlet. Oh, sounds dangerous, Dill said, trying to make it seem a joke. Dangerous, but of course, the officer replied. Not one man in ten survives the trip to Fort Charlet. But that is what makes it so glorious. That is adventure, the real thing, and not the fraudulent wonders you were promised on your cruise. Even though the officer's speech was rather melodramatic, Henry Dill was impressed. For a moment, he seriously considered going on the perilous journey. But then his common sense prevailed. It was one thing to dream of adventure, but it was something else entirely to let a madman send him off on a suicidal trip. I'm sorry, Dill said. I have to join, rejoin my ship. You see, Dill stopped. For his door had opened and two armed soldiers had entered. The officer said sadly, I had hoped to spare you this unpleasantness, but I regret to say that you must go. There is no way out. I told you that last night, when I spoke of the hardships and the dangers, I even begged you to think it over for a few days. <laughs> but you insisted. What are you talking about, Delas? What did I insist on? My poor friend, the officer said, you insisted right there and then on joining the French Foreign Legion. And now there is no way out. These men are your escort. They will accompany you on the journey to Fort Chalet. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich. And that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash hero. Although every word of this story is as true as despair, I do not expect people to believe it. Nowadays, a rational explanation is required before belief is possible. Let me at once then offer the rational explanation. It is held that Harry and Laura Innes were under a delusion on that 31st of October and that this supposition places the whole matter on a satisfactory and believable basis. But there were three who took part in the events of the 31st. The other man still lives and can speak to the truth of the least credible part of Harry's story. October the 31st. It began like any other last day of the month and progressed into terror as it moved beyond midnight. I never in my life knew what it was like to have enough money to satisfy the most ordinary needs. I used to paint in those days, 
and Laura used to write, and we felt sure we could keep the pot at least simmering. Living in town was out of the question, so we went to look for a cottage in the country. We wanted something that was both sanitary and picturesque. So rarely do these two qualities meet in one cottage that for a long time our search was fruitless. We were lucky in the end, though. Two days before our honeymoon started, we discovered the ideal thing on the outskirts of the village of Brenzett, near the marshes. We got a tall, old village woman called Mrs. Dorman to do for us, and as the cottage slowly became habitable, we began to devote more of our time to earning a living. Laura began to sell her stories, and I really felt the atmosphere was helping my painting. We had three months of married happiness. One October evening, I'd been down to smoke a pipe with the village doctor. Laura had stayed at home to finish a comic sketch for a woman's magazine. I'd left her laughing over her own jokes. I came back to find her crying on the window seat in the light of the dying day. Darling, what is it? Oh, please, darling. It's, it's Mrs. Dorman. What? What's she done? She says she's got to go before the end of the month. She says her niece is ill. She's gone down to see her now, but I don't believe that's the reason. Her niece is always ill. I think someone's been saying something against us. She was acting so queerly. Oh, come she... on, darling. Never mind. It's all right. Don't cry. But don't Have you I... see? It's serious. Hmm? We'll have to work all day. We'll only be able to rest while we're waiting for the kettle to boil. We won't have time to earn any money. Listen, listen. There'll be plenty of time, even if we do have to... Laura, listen to me. Uh, I'll speak to Mrs. Dorman when she comes back and see if I can't make her change her mind. She probably wants more money or something. It'll be all right, you see. Come on, love. It's a beautiful evening, not dark yet. Let's take a walk up to the church. Hmm? Come on, darling, fetch a coat. I don't need a coat. It's not cold out. Harry, I will learn to cook soon. Oh, but... Don't worry. We walked under the yew trees up to the little old church. The path was called the Beer Walk because years before it had been the way by which the corpses had been carried to burial. I didn't tell Laura this, though. She was impressionable. The church was Norman, and was only used on Sundays. On either side of the altar lay a grey marble figure of a knight in full plate armour, lying upon a low slab, with hands held up in everlasting prayer. Their names were lost, but the villagers said they'd been murderers, marauders by land and sea. They'd been guilty of deeds so foul that the house they had lived in, the big house, by the way, that had stood on the site of our cottage, had been stricken by lightning and the vengeance of heaven. I didn't tell Laura this either. She wasn't so engrossed in folklore as I was. We walked to the chancel, looked for a while at the sleeping warriors, and then slowly made our way home. Mrs. Dorman had come back from the village and so as soon as Laura had gone to our bedroom, I went into the kitchen to square things up with our servant. Well, can't you... Uh, can't you stay for another month? No, sir. I'm bound to go by Thursday. Yeah, but it's Monday today. I, I mean... I think you might have let us know before. There's no time now to get anybody else. My wife's not up to too much heavy work. Well, can't you stay till next week? I might be able to come back next week. Good, but... 
But why do you have to go this week? Come on, out with it. It's cold, sir. They say, sir, that this was a big house in Catholic times, and there was many deeds done here. Well, tell me about it, Mrs. Dorman. Well, you needn't mind about telling me. I won't make fun or anything. Would you like to sit down? No, sir, thank you. Well? Well, sir, you may have seen in the church beside the altar two shapes. The knights in armour? Effigies? I mean them two bodies, drawed out, man-size in marble. Man-size in marble. I thought then that her description was a thousand times more graphic than mine. They do say, as on All Saints' Eve, them two bodies sit up on their slabs and gets off them, and then walks down the aisle in their marble. And as the church clock strikes eleven, they walks out of the church door and over the graves and along the beer walk. And if it's a wet night, there's the marks of their feet in the morning. And uh, where do they go? They come back here to their home, sir. And if anyone meets them... Well, what then? I'm sorry. I've got to go, sir. But my niece, she's sick. I've got to go. It's all right, Mrs. Dorman. Hey, if you promise to come back afterwards again, we don't want to lose you. Uh, what uh, the knights, the legend, uh, I mean, uh, after they've arrived here, what are they supposed to do then? I, I mean... Um, Whatever you do, sir, lock the door early on All Saints' Eve. And make the cross sign over the doorstep and on the windows. But has anyone ever seen these things? That's not for me to say. I know what I know, sir. Ah. Well, um, who was here last year at the cottage? No one, sir. The lady has owned the house, only stayed here in summer, and she always went to London a full month before the night. All saints. <laughs> I'm sorry to inconvenience you and, and your lady, but my niece is ill and I must go on Thursday. I didn't tell Laura of the shapes that walked in their marble, partly because a legend concerning our house might trouble her, and partly, I think, from some more occult reason. I soon forgot about it myself, anyway. I was painting a portrait of Laura against the lattice window, and I couldn't think of much else. There! Stick! Potatoes. Oh, tell me I'm learning fast. Say it's as good as Mrs. Dorman, even if it isn't. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Ah. Oh, the painting's coming along marvellously, darling. Mm? There's only one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is better than Mrs. Dorman. Uh, what's that? I don't believe you. Harry, mm? it's a lovely painting, but... You've made me really beautiful. Well, you are beautiful. Mm. I love you. Well, if you love me, get your elbow out of my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday passed off pretty well. Actually, the steak was like boots, and the potatoes were hardly cooked at all. But I loved her. I loved my darling. Friday came, and it's about what happened that Friday that I'm telling you now. I'll tell my story of it as quickly as I can. Everything that happened that day is burnt into my brain. I shall not forget anything, not leave anything out. You look sad, my darling. Hmm? Yes, I think I am. Oh, uneasy. I didn't think I'm very well. It's not cold, is it? What's the matter? No, not cold. I've shivered lots of times this morning. Do you ever have presentiments of evil? Hmm? 
<laughs> no. I shouldn't believe in them if I had. I do. The night my father died, I knew it. He was right away in the north of Scotland. But I knew. Harry! We haven't played the gramophone since we've been here. Oh, let's play it now. What shall we have? She sorted through our record collection, and she looked like a small child. I loved her then, that morning, more dearly than I've ever loved anyone in the whole of my life. It was the happiest time I've ever known, or hoped to know. The birds sang in the garden of our own home. The autumn was proving to be a mild one, and my Laura seemed gayer than ever she had been, despite her admittance to me that she thought she was not well. The music was beautiful. Laura was chatting away, and as I looked out through the windows at the mass of autumn colouring, the deep scarlet clouds slowly paled into leaden grey against a pale green sky. It was Friday, and Mrs. Dorman had gone off to look after a niece she swore was sick the day before, Thursday. I listened to the music and watched the graceful curve of my Laura's cheek. And it saddens me now, in retrospect, to remember that that day was the last time our now dusty gramophone records ever saw the light of day. There must be millions of them in those marshes. Hmm? The frogs. Mm. Harry, shall we get a little dog? If you like. Maybe not such a little one either. Let's have a great day. Hmm? <laughs> great day? Yes, so that everyone will be frightened and keep away. Well, who do you want to keep away, for pity's sake? People who shouldn't be here. Hmm? Oh, I don't know. Burglars and things. Oh, I think any self-respecting burglar looking around this place would go away in disgust. <laughs> well, we might have something worth stealing one day, but uh, oh, not at the moment, my lovely. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Great Danes are awful cards. Oh, they're not. They're huge. Mm, sure they are. All feet and great lolloping head. All bluff, though. Pekingese would be more likely to create a din and scare away unwanted visitors. Anyway, shall we get a dog? Not a Dane, then. A, a little mongrel or something. With one eye black and one eye brown. Call it Wag or Patch. <laughs> a dog called Wag or Patch shall be delivered here by the end of the week. Oh, <laughs> promise. wonderful. I'd love a canary, too. Oh, well, then a canary you'll have, my darling. I'll give you anything in the world within my power. You know that. I used to have a tortoise when I was a girl. Hmm? <laughs> Are you trying to turn the place into a zoo? <laughs> oh, is my pipe bothering you? No, of course not. What's the time? Um, I'll bust in. All the same, I, um, I think I'll take the last of it outside for a bit. Last of what? My pipe. <laughs> Brutal to sit in here, filling the place with strong cavern dishes. Oh, I don't mind. I'll come with you. No, sweetheart, not tonight. You're much too tired. Shall be long. You were shivering this morning. I'm all right now, honestly. Uh, get to bed. I'll have an invalid to nurse tomorrow, as well as the boots to clean. Hmm? Kiss me, then. Hmm? <laughs> come on, pussy. You're tired. Hmm? Housework's been too much for you. Harry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Harry. Oh, Laura, my sweet love. I'll not be long out there. Just... Taste of strong Cavendish. <laughs> oh, I am a bit tired. Yes, I know. We've been very happy today, haven't we, darling? 
Don't stay out too long. I won't. What a night it was. The jagged masses of heavy dark cloud were rolling at intervals from horizon to horizon, and thin white wreaths covered the stars. Through all the rush of the cloud river, the moon swam, breasting the waves and disappearing again in darkness. I could see the church tower standing out black and grey against the sky. Eleven o'clock already. My pipe was out. I looked in at the bedroom window and saw Laura half lying on her chair in front of her dressing table. My heart went out to her. I decided to take a walk up to the church. So, with a last look at my dearest wife, I left our cottage and began my walk. There must be a God, I thought to myself, and a God who was good. How otherwise could anything as sweet as Laura ever have been imagined? When I reached the church, I noticed the door was open. I blamed myself for leaving it unlatched the other night. We were the only people who ever cared to come to the church, except on Sundays. I went inside. It seems strange, perhaps, that I should have gone halfway up the aisle before I remembered, with a sudden chill, followed by as sudden a rush of self-contempt, that this was the very day and hour when, according to tradition, the shapes drawed out man-size in marble, began to walk. Having remembered the legend, I decided to go and have a look at the marble knights. I thought how pleasant it would be to tell Mrs. Dorman how ridiculous her fancies were, and how peacefully the marble figures slept on through the ghastly hour. With my hands in my pockets, I passed up the aisle. In the grey, dim light, the eastern end of the church looked larger than usual, and the arches above the two tombs looked larger too. And then the moon came out and showed me the reason. I stopped short and my heart gave a leap that nearly choked me. The bodies were gone! Marble slabs lay wide and bare in the moonlight that slanted through the east window. Was I mad? I passed my hand over the smooth slabs. Some joke. The figures were gone, and I was alone in the church. Or was I? And then a horror seized me, a horror indefinable and indescribable, an overwhelming certainty of supreme and accomplished calamity. Laura! 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 Get out of my way! Hey, 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 but what are you? Hurry! Let go! Let go! The marble figures have gone from the church. They've gone. Let go. <laughs> oh, I'll have to give you a draft tomorrow, I see. You've been listening to old wives' tales. Huh? I've seen the bare slabs, man. Let go! Now, hurry, hurry, man. Listen to me, will you? Now, listen. Are you... You gave me a scare, Doctor. I, I'm going to old Palmer's place. His daughter's sick. I'll go by way of the church. Show me the bare slabs. Well, you go if you like. I'm going home to my wife. Look, will you let go my arm? Oh, rubbish, man. Do you think I'll permit that? Are you to go saying all your life that you've seen marble endowed with vitality? And me to go all me life saying you're a coward? No, no, sir, you shan't do it. Now, come on. Uh, come on now. I'll prove to you you were dreaming. We went back to that terrible church and walked up the aisle. Walked to the marble slabs. 
The doctor produced matches. I admit I closed my eyes. I knew the figures would not be there. <laughs> Here they are. Eh, you see, right enough. Eh, you've been dreaming or drinking. Eh, asking your pardon for the imputation, eh? <laughs> I opened my eyes and looked, and by the dying matchlight I saw the two shapes in marble, hands in prayer. <coughs> Blast! I burnt my fingers. Oh, oh, blasphemy in a church. Still, it wasn't meant. So, satisfied, Harry? Oh, it must have been some trick of the light or something. Do you know, I, I was quite convinced they were gone. I'm aware of that. You'll have to be careful of that brain of yours, my friend. Now I'm warning you, huh? Hello? Oh, something has been afoot here. His hand is broken. What? Well, the knight's no, hand, see, it's broken. Well, maybe somebody tried to remove them. They... They were both all right last time Laura and I came here. Well, someone might have tried to prize them up. Oh, that... Wouldn't account for my impression. Uh, well, too much painting and tobacco, and maybe indulgence in some of the hard stuff, too, perhaps. Never. Oh, look, come on, man, or my wife will be getting anxious. Oh, you come in and have a drop of whiskey with me and drink confusion to ghosts and better sense to me, won't you? I ought to go to Palmer's, but... Ah, uh, well, it's late. I'll leave it till tomorrow. She's not all that sick. Oh, let's go back, then. I... Hey, you're getting along fine in the cottages then, Harry. Oh, we're uh, making do. Had a bit of a servant problem. Who doesn't have servant troubles? You're not alone there, Harry. Ever since the day I came to the place, servants have driven me mad. We walked to our cottage. We saw, as we walked up the path, the bright light streaming out of the front door. Presently, I noticed the parlour door was open, too. Had she gone out, I wondered? We passed into the parlour. It was all ablaze with candles. Her chair was empty, and her handkerchief and book lay on the floor. I turned to the window, and there, in the recess of the window, I saw her. Laura! Good grief, man! Oh, Laura! Laura, my baby, Laura. It's all right, my darling. I'm here, I'm here. There, out here. of the way! Laura, it's all right, pussy. Please, baby, I'm here. Oh, forgive me. She fell into my arms in a heap. I kissed her and held her. But I think I knew all the time that she was dead. Please, what happened? Her hands were tightly clenched. I'm sorry. Sorry. In one of them, she held something fast. When I was quite sure that she was dead and that nothing mattered at all any more, I let the doctor open her hand to see what it was she held. It was a grey marble finger. Beyond Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder. The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McCabe. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. 
You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Tonight, two stories about animals. First, here's a gentleman to tell you about a famous patent medicine known as Oil of Dog by Ambrose Bias. <coughs> My name is Buffa Beans. I was born of honest parents in one of the humbler walks of life. My father being a manufacturer of dog oil, and my mother having a small studio in the shadow of the village church, where she disposed of unwelcomed babies. In my boyhood, I was trained to the habits of industry. I not only assisted my father in procuring dogs for his vats, but was frequently employed by my mother to carry away the debris of her work in the studio. In performance of this duty, I sometimes had need of all my natural intelligence, for all the law offices in the vicinity were opposed to my mother's business. They were not elected on an opposition ticket, and the matter had never been made a political issue. Um, it just happened so. My father's business of making dog oil was naturally less unpopular, though the owners of missing dogs sometimes regarded him with suspicion, which was reflected to some extent upon me. My father had, as silent partners, all the physicians of the town, who seldom wrote a prescription which did not contain what they were pleased to designate as oil of canine. It is really the most valuable medicine ever discovered. But most persons are unwilling to make personal sacrifices for the afflicted. And it was evident that many of the fattest dogs in town had been forbidden to play with me. A fact which pained my young sensibilities. And at one time, came near to driving me to be a pirate. Looking back upon those days, I cannot but regret, at times, that by indirectly bringing my beloved parents to their death, I was the author of misfortunes profoundly affecting my future. One evening, while passing my father's oil factory with the body of a foundling from my mother's studio, I saw a constable who seemed to be closely watching my movements. Young as I was, I had learned that a constable's acts of whatever apparent character are prompted by the most reprehensible motives. And I avoided him by dodging into the oilery by a side door which happened to stand ajar. I locked it at once. 
and was alone with my dead. My father had retired for the night. The only light in the place came from the furnace, which glowed a deep, rich crimson under one of the vats, casting ruddy reflections on the wall. Within the cauldron, the oil still rolled in indolent ebullition, occasionally pushing to the surface a piece of dog. Seating myself to wait for the constable to go away, I held the naked body of the foundling in my lap and tenderly stroked its short, silken hair. Ah, how beautiful it was. Even at that early age, I was passionately fond of children. And as I looked upon this cherub, I could almost find it in my heart to wish that the small red wound upon its breast, the work of my dear mother, had not been mortal. It had been my custom to throw the babies into the river, which nature had thoughtfully provided for the purpose. But that night, I did not dare to leave the oilery for fear of the constable. After all, I said to myself, it cannot greatly matter if I put it into this cauldron. My father will never know the bones from that of a puppy. And the few deaths which may result from administering another kind of oil for the incomparable oil of canine are not important in a population which increases so rapidly. In short, I took the first step in crime and brought myself untold sorrow by casting the baby into the cauldron. The next day, somewhat to my surprise, my father rubbed his hands with satisfaction as he reported to my dear mother. Amazing. Simply amazing. What is it, dear? You're absolutely radiant. Do tell us what has happened. Astounding. They said they never saw anything like it. Never saw anything like what, my dear Mr. Beans? The oil. This morning's bats produced the finest quality oil that was ever seen. They all said so. Oh, the physicians to whom I showed the samples pronounced it the finest ever. Well, dear, what did you do to improve it so? Don't tell us, for heaven's sake. Oh, but that's just it. I have no knowledge whatsoever as to how the result was obtained. Oh, the dogs were treated in all respects as usual. Oh, they were, in fact, of a very ordinary breed. Uh, was that not so, Buffer? Uh, buffer! I deemed it my duty uh, to explain, which I did, though palsy would have been my tongue if I could have foreseen the consequences. Mr. Beans, how very disconcerting that for so long we should have been ignorant of combining our industries. True, true, Mrs. Beans, and we must take immediate measures to repair our error. Certainly so, Mr. Beans, certainly so. First thing, we shall remove my studio to a wing of the factory building. Oh, this very evening. This very evening we shall begin. Oh, Buffer dear, what greater joy might a beloved son bring to his beloved parents than an enterprising mind? And my duties in connection with the business ceased. I was no longer required to dispose of the bodies of the small superfluous, and there was no need of alluring dogs to their doom. For my father discarded them altogether, though they still had an honorable place in the name of the oil. So, suddenly thrown into idleness, I might naturally have been expected to become vicious and dissolute. But I did not. I did not. The holy influence of my dear mother was ever about me to protect me from the temptations which beset you. And my father was a deacon in the church. Ah, alas! that through my fault these estimable persons should have come to so bad an end. Finding a double profit in her business, my mother now devoted herself to it with a new assiduity. She removed not only superfluous and unwelcome babies to order, but went out into the highways and byways, gathering in children of a larger growth, and even such adults as she could entice. My father, too, enamored of the superior quality of oil produced, pervade for his vats uh, with diligence and zeal. 
the conversion of their neighbours into dog oil became, in short, uh, the one passion of their lives. An absorbing and overwhelming greed took possession of their souls and served them in place of a hope in heaven. So enterprising had they now become that a public meeting uh, was held. And we are resolved, Mr. and Mrs. Bing, that our censuring must needs be severe if your invasions upon the population continue. We assure you that further raids will be met in a spirit of hostility by one and all. My poor parents left the meeting broken-hearted. And, I believe, not altogether sane. Anyhow, I deemed it prudent not to enter the oilery with them that night but slept outside in a stable. About midnight, some mysterious impulse caused me to sneak through an open window into the furnace room, where I knew my father slept now. The fires were burning as brightly as if the following day's harvest uh, was expected to be abundant. One of the large cauldrons was slowly walloping with a mysterious appearance of self-restraint as if it bided its time to put forth its full energy. And my father was not in bed. He had risen in his night clothes and was preparing a noose in a strong cord. From the looks which he cast at the door of my mother's bedroom, I knew too well the purpose he had in mind. Speechless and motionless with terror, I could do nothing in prevention or warning. Uh, suddenly, the door of my mother's apartment was opened, noiselessly, and the two confronted each other, both apparently surprised. The lady also was in her night clothes, and she held in her right hand uh, the tool of her trade, a long, narrow-bladed dagger. For one instant, they looked into each other's blazing eyes, and then sprang together in indescribable fury. Round and round the room they struggled, the man cursing, the woman shrieking, both fighting like demons. She to strike him with the dagger, he to strangle her with his bare hands. I know not how long I had the unhappiness to observe this disagreeable instance of domestic infelicity. But at last, after a more than usual vigorous struggle, the combatants suddenly moved apart. My father's breast and my mother's weapon showed evidences of contact. For another instant, they glared at each other in the most unamiable way. Then, my poor wounded father, feeling the hand of death upon him, leaped forward, unmindful of resistance, grasped my dear mother in his arms, dragged her to the side of the boiling cauldron, collected all his failing energy, and sprang in with her. In a moment, both had disappeared, and were adding their oil to that of the committee of citizens who had called the day before with an invitation to the public meeting. Convinced that these unhappy events closed to me every avenue of an honorable career in that town, I removed to the famous city of Atomwee, where these memoirs are written with a heart full of remorse for a heedless act entailing so dismal a commercial disaster. of Dog by Ambrose Bierce. And now, a story by Saki about two lady horsemen and a hyena. They say that all hunting stories are the same, but my hunting story isn't a bit like any you've ever heard. It happened... Quite a while ago, all the usual crowd were at the meet, especially Constance Broder, 
circumstances, one of those strapping, florid girls that go well with autumn scenery or Christmas decorations in church. I have a presentiment that something dreadful is going to happen. Am, am I looking pale? Oh, you're looking nicer than usual. But that's so easy for you, dear. Constance and I were well mounted, and we had no difficulty in keeping ourselves in the first flight, though it was a fairly stiff run. Towards the finish, however, we must have held rather too independent a line, for we lost the hounds and found ourselves plodding aimlessly along miles from anywhere. It was fairly exasperating, and my temper was beginning to let itself go by inches, when suddenly... There they go at last! What in heaven's name are they hunting? Well, apparently it's not a fox. No mortal fox. It's twice as high. And what an ugly small head. And its neck. Enormous and thick. It's a hyena. That's what it is. It must have escaped from Lord Pabham's park. A hyena? Yes, and it's probably tame. Look, the dogs don't know what to do about it. Oh, dear. They're running off. The hyena hailed our approach with unmistakable relief and demonstrations of friendliness. What are we to do? It's getting dark. What a person you are for questions, my dear. Well, well, we can't stay here all night with a hyena. I shouldn't think of staying here all night, even without a hyena. We had better make for that ridge of trees to the right. I imagine the highway is just beyond. I hope it is. What on earth are we to do with the hyena? What does one generally do with hyenas? Well, I, I've never had anything to do with one before. Well, neither have I. If we knew its sex, we might give it a name. Perhaps we might call it Esme. That would do in either case. Esme? Here, Esme. Come along. Come along. There, there must be a gypsy encampment nearby. Gypsies? Why do you say that? We just, just passed a baby, a half-naked gypsy brat. What was he doing there? Picking blackberries, obviously. There. Esme has probably frightened it. Esme? Esme? Come along here. Esme? What have you got there? Esme? Esme? Put down that baby. Esme? Merciful heaven, Baroness, what on earth shall we do? What are we to do? Constance, I am perfectly certain that at the last judgment you will ask more questions than the examining ferrets. Esme, down. Down, Esme. Can't we do something? Esme, if you don't put that baby down, I'll thrash you with this whip. Constance, I really don't know what more I can do. We best get along. Esme can catch up. Come along. Do you think the poor little thing suffered much? Well, the indications were all that way, my dear. Ah, oh, we are saved. There's the highway. Where? Up ahead. Didn't you hear the car? There. There. There's another. Ah, here comes Esme. There, Esme. Naughty. You're a naughty hyena. Can you let that ravening beast trot by your side? Oh, dear. What is he? What is 
it heading for his mouth? I can't quite tell, dear. Now, now, pay attention. There's the road ahead. Don't run ahead, Esme. The cars won't be able to see you at this hour. Esme, hold. Stay with us. Oh, oh the silly animal. Well, I don't think we should worry about that beast. No. I dare say he can fend for himself. Oh, Esme, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Ladies, ladies, is this... Was this your dog? I'm, I'm dreadfully oh, sorry. I'm you, you, you have killed my Esme. <laughs> I'm so awfully sorry. I, I, oh. I keep dogs myself, so, so I know what you must feel about it. I, I'll do anything I can in reparation, anything please, at all. Please bury him at once. That yes. much I think I may ask certainly, of you. Certainly, certainly. At, at once, madam. William, William, bring the spade. No, the spade, William. Uh, I saw. What a magnificent fellow. I'm afraid he must have been rather a valuable animal. Well, he took second in the puppy class at oh. Birmingham last year. Oh. oh! Don't cry, dear. It was all over in a moment, I'm sure. He couldn't have suffered much. Oh, look here. You you simply must let me do something in, in, in reparation. I couldn't think oh, of but, it. Oh, but I insist. No. No, no, I... I just... couldn't think of it. But as he persisted, I let him have my address. Lord Pebble never advertised the loss of his hyena when a strictly fruit-eating animal strayed from his park a, a year or two previously. He was called upon to give compensation in 11 cases of sheep worrying and practically to restock his neighbor's poultry guards. And an escaped hyena would have mounted up to something on the scale of a governmental grant the gypsies were equally unobtrusive over their missing offspring. I don't suppose in large encampments they really know to a child or two how many they've got. There was a sequel to the adventure, though. I got through the post a charming little diamond brooch with the name Esme set in a sprig of rosemary. Incidentally, too, I lost the friendship of Constance Brodel. You see, when I sold the brooch, I, I quite properly refused to give her any share of the proceeds. I pointed out that the Esme part of the affair was my own invention, and the hyena part of it belonged to Lord Pabham, if it really was his hyena, of which... Of course, I've no proof. That was Esme by Saki. The part of the two ladies was played by Pat Franklin. The motorist was Bernard Mays. The hyena was played by himself. In Oil of Dog, the first of our two stories this evening... The family was variously performed by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production was by John Whiting. And now, good night. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio